we this we're gonna have this exact same conversation about the goddamn Mac Pro whenever that gets refreshed. We have much more conversation. It's not gonna be a new Mac Pro. It's just gonna be a, a fancier iMac. It'll be a short conversation. It'll be fine, and then then I'll we'll buy one anyway, and that'll be that. I agree with most of what you just said, except it'll be a short conversation. Yeah, thank you, Marco. Well, Completely agree. It'll last a show or two. I'm just saying, it's not like we're going to be obsessing. A over. show or two? It'll last a month or two. <laughs> well, I guess we'll, what we'll do is we'll go back to talking about the Mac Pro, and they're like, okay, fine, so they did this iMac thing, but now let's complain more about why they should actually do a real Mac Pro. Remember when they used to sell a professional computer 15 shows later? So I think we finally wrapped that up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But we won't be talking about the iMac. The iMac Pro will be we'll take care of in a show or two. That's true. And then and then one more show when we all get ours. But then mostly we'll go back to complaining about it. Seriously, you're not really making the Mac Pro anymore, especially if they don't say they're not making it and they keep selling the old one. That'll be awesome. They come up with a new iMac at WWDC and it's got a Z on it, but they keep selling the old Mac Pro. It'll be like, what are you doing? <laughs> what is going through your head? Here's a question. Do you think on January 1st, 2018, the 2013 Mac Pro will still be for sale? No. Absolutely not. I vote yes. I, I would I, if I had to pick. I would vote no. But it's not as big of a. Uh, it's not as sure of a thing as I would. I would hope it would be as I think about it. I'm like, you want to bet five bucks? I'm not betting you any money. I'm guessing January first, twenty eighteen. It's still for sale. I'll take your five dollar bet. Yeah. All right. It's a deal. Because I think it's close. That's why it's an interesting bet. Because I think they'll, because I think they'll introduce an iMac Pro, and they'll be like, "And this is the replacement for the Mac Pro." Like that's that's how I think it will be positioned. And it will finally give them cover to can that stupid machine, to can the can. So my primary um. bet is that <laughs> is that it, it, this is still for sale. That the the 2013 trashy Mac Pro is still for sale on Ge- on January first. My secondary bet, which I I, I guess I will, probably won't put money on, but my secondary bet is that during the entire year of 2017. They won't actually address this issue publicly. They won't even say anything of substance about any kind of future pro har- pro desktop hardware. That basically, like this this year will come and go with no changes to the Mac Pro in either the product line or in announcements. But, but if, they, if they make an iMac Pro, does that count as them saying something? Only, I think only if they discontinue the the Mac Pro. But what if they say this is our new vision for pro hardware, blah blah, blah but then also keep selling it for the same reason they keep selling everything because somebody somewhere wants to buy it? Well, I'd still win the primary bet in that case. The secondary bet of whether they like have done this, I guess, would depend on like it, it'd, it'd be a little bit vague. It'd be like, is it just like the same processor lines, like you know, like the Intel like sixty seven hundred K, whatever? Like, if it, it has it, the word "pro" in the name, like it's clear what they're talking about is. You mm, know? But if it's still pretty much an iMac, like it would need like a xeon like that's like and not an e3 the e3 does not count as a xeon is there an eight core is there an eight core non-xeon uh intel thing no the the in the future i think tipster said a while ago like one of the various lakes coffee or whatever one of those <laughs> there's supposed to be a six core uh variant in the the series but if there is like a quote imac pro but it still has the same consumer processor line that doesn't count to me. That's just that's just an iMac, and because the, the iMac is fine, the iMac is great. I'm using one now. Like, there's a lot of reasons to have an iMac, uh, but they can tack Pro on the end and sell it in space gray and charge more. But if it doesn't have a Xeon E5 in there, that's that's not a Mac Pro. I will argue about it later, but I'm going to bed. You Mac Pro'd him out. That's it. Uh, you, yep, I am. I am tuckered out on the Mac Pro. And it doesn't take much, to be fair. No, it doesn't. <laughs> So, as always, we start with follow-up, and Lucas Gosen, Goosen, I need to look these up before I record. That's okay, though. Uh, Lucas G, right? Uh, he cited an existing app, and we are not going to name that app, that is currently on the iOS App Store that actually has overlapping windows. And Colin Allen also wrote in to say that when he was working at Blackboard, they shipped a multi-window iPad app with gestures. Now, this is a long time ago, from what I can tell. So in Alan's defense, this UI was was modern at the time. Um, looking at it now is mildly alarming. But there are things that are multi-window um, in the on the iPad that exist either in the past or today. So does that change how you feel about things in any way, shape, or form, John? No, because everyone knows there's always things on the App Store that violate guidelines. Like that's that's the whole point of the App Store guidelines. If you try to say, <laughs> if you try to do the little kid thing, but like, why does my sister get to have a lollipop? Like it's just <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are going to be applications that that somehow got by that didn't get flagged, and yours gets flagged. Like your argument is always with with the rule system and not with like people who happen to have skated by. I mean, 
pick a guideline, I guarantee you can find multiple applications on the App Store that violate that guideline. That's just the way it is. But anyway, I like seeing these examples of applications that actually shipped in this way. And, you know, the world didn't come to an end. And also, apparently, it was not a UI paradigm that was copied by lots of other applications. So I'm not quite sure how successful it was. But I like the idea that a few of them snuck through. I like this better than the idea uh, of millions of apps that send you uh, spam push notifications sneaking through, quote unquote. Mm hmm. (laughs) <laughs> all right and then a uh, friend of the show Stephen trout and smith has put together a swift playground that will let you try the floating keyboard on an ipad so you would use the swift playgrounds app on the on the ipad and run the code that he has put on uh, github i believe i have i intended to try this and then completely forgot about it but anyway you can uh, download this drop it in uh, swift playgrounds and give it a shot have either of you tried this nope yeah, see, I really wish I had, but it slipped my mind. John, this is what they get for adding uh, anything resembling a programming environment to iOS. Because someone's like, <laughs> you know what you can do with a programming language? <laughs> you can write programs, and you know what those programs do? They execute on your device without going app review, just as if I had uploaded them from Xcode. But I don't have to do that because I don't have Xcode. I just run this playgrounds file, and so this is all of Apple's worst fears coming true. Oh no, selector swizzling and private APIs. What will happen? <laughs> Nothing will happen. Is the answer. <laughs> Well, I suppose you could probably, you think you could probably, uh, you know, trigger a bug to, you know, I guess you could crash the, the app, obviously, but, uh, no, well, crashing playgrounds may not be such an achievement, but <laughs> could, you bring down, <laughs> could you bring down the whole OS by, uh, finding some kind of a bug or doing something nasty to it? Anyway, uh, that's what programming is. And this is, this is a fun way for people to try it, to see if this little keyboard is worth anything. And it, it's kind of weird because you'd want to use it with thumbs like you would on a phone, but you can't reach it with both your thumbs on an iPad. Like that's the whole deal that it is a tiny little floating keyboard that you can move where you want it to, where you want to put it so it can be out of the way and not take up so much screen space, but you can't type on it with two thumbs. Uh, there's no, I, maybe if you put it in the corner, <laughs> I don't know. There's no way to use it. There's no way to use it. Like you use it on your phone. Although I know a lot of people, myself included, who frequently type with a single thumb on the, on their phones. You ever do that where you're like your one hand is occupied and you're texting something with a single thumb it's i'm i'm okay at it yeah i wish i was the swipe keyboards i haven't used one in a while in fact i just took that keyboard off my phone because i use it so rarely but the swipe style keyboards and i think uh, google's keyboard gboard or whatever it's called supports this the swipe style keyboards uh, are very good for one-handed use but i find that i don't use it often enough that i just made it go away I think I have the I have inappropriate thumb friction for a swipe keyboard because every time I try them I can't <laughs> I can't find the right balance of enough pressure to be swiping correctly but not too much pressure that I'm like scrubbing my thumb against the like it just I I need to tap I'm I'm not a swiper I I remember seeing demos of those keyboard like wow this is awesome look at that little line darting from key to key but then when it comes time for my big meaty thumb to do that it, there's it's it's hopeless so. <laughs> <laughs> More power to you if it works for you, but I cannot get the swiping to work for me. Oh, my word. I don't even know what to make about this. <laughs> All right, we, we should just move on. Uh, John, can you tell us about Apple in education? Got a lot of feedback from people, basically people in education, people who are either teachers or school uh, administrators or uh, people who do IT uh, in education. I tried to pull a few salient points out because a lot of people had, uh, you know, very complicated detail stories about their one situation but I'm trying to uh, generalize here. So one theme I saw in a lot of the email was the recent, in recent years, push for one device per student, which was not a thing when any of us were in school, like that, that not just in the super rich schools, but then in all schools, the ideal is when we're going to buy any kind of computing hardware for students, we want to have one for every single student, which was just not an option in, you know, in our days, because you'd have a computer lab and like each classroom would have like one iMac Mm -hmm. or two iMacs or something like, but the, you know, one computer for every student and that, wasn't really feasible when computers came with gigantic CRTs and took up a huge amount of room. But now that they're all really small and portable and uh, cheaper, you can pull that off. So the one device per student uh, accounts for an increase in overall volume of computing things that schools buy, which is good for good for Google in this case because they're <laughs> they're selling most of them. Um, we had one report of technology getting more funding than like. Uh, less sexy areas uh, like music and arts which are you know perennially un- perennially underfunded because tech is sexy i think one of you brought this up in the last show like the idea that 
there's money to buy computery stuff because everyone agrees that computers are the future and our kids need computers. And like, <laughs> I mean, obviously they're the present now, but when we were kids, it was like, oh, everyone's going to learn computers because it's the future. And if we get computers in our school, everyone feels good about it, even though we're not entirely sure if these computers make education better in any possible way. But hey, at least kids will know computers. Uh, there's still some of that in there and that it's exciting for all the kids in your school to, you know, get iPads or get laptops or anything like that. Um, and we had a couple of people uh, tell us that although Apple no longer makes education-only models like uh, the Big Ugly Tooth and the, uh, the, EMAC. the EMAC and stuff like that, they do have special configurations of existing devices uh, that, that like you can't buy in the store but are only available for education. And they also do a thing where they continue to sell devices in education even if the, even after they're no longer for sale to consumers. I think the last time I remember them doing that in a big way was the iPad 2 that was like gone for everybody, but education can still buy it. So they're still trying to do what they can to give education. There's no real nice way to say this, but like the cheaper, crappier <laughs> models. Because <laughs> every... Even the education-only models, like, how were they different from the regular ones? They were cheaper, which is important, but they were also crappier, because how do you get them cheaper? You make them crappier. And it always struck me as, like, a, a weird bargain, because oh, do you want to give a, a RAM-starved computer to a school? Is, is a school the best equipped to wrangle a computer that is constantly running out of RAM, especially in the bad old days without it, without even any virtual memory on, on Macs or without a good virtual memory system anyway. That's less of a concern these days, but just to down-spec so badly and then put those machines into an environment where the people available to, like, baby them and, and coax every ounce of performance out of them, like, it's not... They're, they're, they don't have time for that. It's much better to give them a computer that sort of works without anyone having to mess with it. And if you decontent a computer to use car parlance... That's a bad situation, but that's what they want. They want it to be as cheap as possible, so Apple will, would make them very cheap models, and now Apple will keep selling you devices long after no person should ever be using them, but I guess schools <laughs> will. I mean, again, I look at the, like the laptop cart in my kid's elementary school filled with ice books. How old are those? How old is that, you know, the white plastic iBook? That's an old machine. Like, it was a great machine when it was available, and apparently it was good for education because they aren't all dead, right? <laughs> I don't know how sturdy. I mean, I'm assuming they're all, like, terribly yellowed and stained and gross from you know kids touching them because it was plastic but um like, you know computers last as long as i don't until they break because why would you get rid of them and they could just continue to try to find something useful to do with them um and on that front by the way in terms of tech funding and everything i live in a uh, a place full of rich people and we <laughs> have high taxes and we vote ourselves we have like the laws in the books to say we can't raise taxes more than x percent per year and every year they have a vote to say if you really want to raise taxes on yourself vote for this and every year we vote for it to like to bypass the thing to raise our taxes even more and despite all that our public schools you go into them and, and you know from the standards of my own childhood they are woefully underfunded in every single aspect large class sizes facilities all falling apart and the vast majority of the computing technology that arrives in the school on a yearly basis is paid for entirely out of the pocket of parents giving money to the school, like voluntarily themselves, just funding like that. So that's more that says more about the state of public education funding mm -hmm. in in our country than it does about uh, things in tech. But it's comparing it to my childhood when there was like a computer lab with a small number of computers and like my my kids. Uh, experience in school where there are more computers but that all of them had to be bought by their rich parents of the students who go to the school it certainly doesn't seem like we are in an age where it is accepted that schools will all have like one device per student and everyone will have at least in elementary school will have computers for everyone available it's like oh you'll have computers if you live in a place where all the parents have enough disposable income to each give hundreds of dollars to the school each year it's the same way we got a new playground, by the way. Oh, collect money from all the rich parents. I and, mean, you know, we're glad to do it because our kids are going there and we have the money and we pay for it. But it seems like the wrong way to fund public education. Anyway, that's I'm really getting <laughs> off topic. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, I probably have told the story once before, but to just reiterate how terrible public education is, even in relatively affluent uh, areas. I grew up in uh, Fairfield County, Connecticut, which at the time, because of other areas of the county, was, I believe, the most affluent county uh, in the entire country. I lived in a, in a very unremarkable part of it, so 
it was not quite the same for for me, but certainly it was a fairly homogeneous, relatively affluent area. And every year, probably about three quarters of the way through the year, our copier paper, our Xerox paper, was perforated in a very weird way. And curiously, every single page we got said Danbury Hospital Radiology Department uh, on the bottom of it. And that's because the only way we could have copier paper, the only way we could afford it, is if the local hospital donated it to us. And it was, I guess, their leftover that that they had, had perforated in a particular way for their particular use. But we just rolled with it because what what other choice did we have? And unlike you guys who are, I guess, better than, than we were at the time, we would beg to raise taxes just the teeniest, littlest bit to give the schools a little breathing room. And every time it was shot down, and even as a kid, it drove me bananas. <sighs> I don't know. Marco, you're only like a year away from dealing with this, right? Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, kindergarten starts this fall for our kid. So here we go. Uh, yeah. Have you for Delightful. preschool or for daycare? Have you as have they probably not because that's like privately funded. But kindergarten to see if this is like a nationwide thing or just in certain areas. I was surprised when I first could enter kindergarten that one of the things that teachers would ask for is uh, paper towels and tissues and things like that. It yeah. seemed like staples of the classroom. Like, hey, parents. Like when I was a kid, when the teachers asked the parents for anything, it was, hey, parents, have your kids bring in some canned food for a food drive for the needy right instead in, in my experience with my own children it's hey parents please bring in boxes of tissues because if you don't there will be no tissues in the classroom because we have no money for them which is like seriously like I'm, these are not frills that's like, still a thing like oh we want to buy a fancy new imac every year it's like we need literal tissues for kids with boogery noses in kindergarten <laughs> and there is no money to pay for them like we can we can put a building that keeps the rain out and we can keep the temperature vaguely within human habitable range but beyond that you know you're on your own so it's time to <laughs> everyone to pitch in and make sure that we have uh tissues and paper towels for kids in the class yeah that's uh, teachers still buy a, a lot more than most people know or expect teachers still buy these kind of supplies out of their own pocket um, it's kind of horrible like it, it you know teachers all know this and families of teachers all know this but uh most people don't and it's kind of sad and you know because te- it's not like teachers are paid a lot to begin with so like you have these jobs that are already not paid you know what they're worth and then you have the teachers having to buy like basic supplies for their classroom out of their own pockets that that seems so incredibly wrong to me yeah, but yeah, for those that don't know, Aaron was a high school teacher in a reasonably affluent area of Richmond um, until she had Declan. And it was expected that at all grade levels, every single teacher, uh, and so this is every high school teacher you have, will send home a list. And there, there was a term for it. And for the life of me, I can't remember what the, the name of it was. But they would send home a list of supplies that every student was expected to get. So every student was expected to bring Aaron like one pack of tissues and one set of like whiteboard markers because we, they didn't have blackboards. They had whiteboards. Um uh, and like a handful of other things. And this was not unusual. This was expected. And our schools, as far as I can tell, are reasonably well funded. I mean, this it's not the utter disaster that that is happening in many, many, many parts of the country. But even still, there they're so there's so big a discrepancy between what teachers need and what teachers can pr- provide and what the schools can provide that they would have the parents bring all this stuff in too. It, it was it was totally bananas, but it's what they had to do. We are sponsored this week by Eero. Visit Eero.com for more info. Eero is the solution to mediocre home Wi-Fi coverage. Because let's face it, we have so many Wi-Fi devices these days. Uh, you know, we, now we have, beyond our, our computers and phones, we have speakers, thermostats, light bulbs, everything all over our smart homes now. And Wi-Fi just doesn't reach most of your home if you only have one regular router. Eero is designed to change all of this. Eero manufactures a single device. It's a small box about the size of an Apple TV, and it serves as a wireless router. And with a dead simple app, you can put multiple Eros throughout your home. They sell them in sets. You can just buy one if you want to, but you're really getting the the biggest benefit if you have two or three. Uh, The first one replaces your existing router. You just plug your Ethernet wiring into it from your DSL modem or your cable modem. And additional Eros, you just plug them in for a standard power outlet. And then they connect wirelessly to each other to form a mesh network that blankets your home in fast, reliable Wi-Fi. A distributed system like this is way better than just having one router with a whole bunch of antennas on top of it uh, or 
any kind of traditional range extenders, Eero is actually better because it creates a separate network to talk to the uh, other Eero routers on, which is way faster, and it doesn't as it doesn't have nearly as much of a speed hit as a typical range extender. Um, they recommend one Eero per uh, roughly every thousand square feet of your house. So the average U.S. home, uh, you need probably two or three of them. Uh, a three pack is a great starting point. Check it out today. There's a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you end up having too many, if you don't need, let's say you buy the three pack, you only need two. Within 30 days, you can just return the extra one, and you'll get you'll get part of your money back. Um, Eero has been reviewed and seen on tons of press outlets, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, The Verge, TechCrunch, everywhere. They have a massively great star rating on Amazon right now. It's like four four and a half stars on Amazon. You will see for yourself. And they did something cool here. They know that if I just tell you to go to their site and get, enter a promo code, there's a good chance you're going to buy it from Amazon or something anyway. So there's no more promo code. Everyone gets the same low prices now. The three pack is now a hundred dollars off, permanently lowered from four four ninety nine to three ninety nine. So now for just four hundred bucks, you get a three pack of these. If you only need two of them, that's just three hundred bucks now, fifty bucks less than it was before. To get Eero at this new low price, you can visit Eero.com. That's e e r o dot com, or you can just go to Best Buy or Amazon if you want to do that too and buy them there. Check it out today, Eero e e r o. Thank you very much to Eero for sponsoring our show once again. There was a video that came out, I don't know, at this point it was probably almost a month ago, maybe it was a couple of weeks ago at the very least, and it's in... ATP, bringing you cutting edge news. <laughs> As we always do. And this is at apple.com slash iOS slash home. There'll be a link in the show notes. And this is the HomeKit like demo promo commercially video thing. And I watched it once when it first came out, and I haven't seen it since. But the general gist of it was there's a young woman who wakes up and and has her breakfast, which is all automated, and leaves the house, which is all automated, and then eventually comes home, which is all automated, and watches a movie, which is all automated, and reads in bed, which is, I guess, reading in bed, and then turns off her lights, which is automated. <laughs> and it's all amazing and perfect in every way. And as someone who doesn't really do any of the um, robots in a cylinder sort of thing... This looked pretty impressive to me. It looked cool. Um, I can't say that I have the faith. I, I mean, I don't know where I would even get a HomeKit powered thing. As far as I'm concerned, they're still uh, all but vaporware. But apparently they exist because they're all in this lady's house. So I don't know. There's been a little bit of chatter about this. Do you want to tell us about it, John? This is a tweet from Scott McNulty on Twitter. I'm not sure if he has all these devices. I know he's got a, a million Kindles, but I'm not sure if he has all this other stuff. But anyway, <laughs> his tweet about it, uh, about this new website that Apple has to promote HomeKit was, nice website, but the film just showcases to me how much easier it is to tell Alexa to do all the same things. Because the video shows, for the most part, uh, the person touching big rounded rectangles on ios devices whether they be ipads or phone to do things there is hey C good morning at the very beginning speaking to your phone that's on your nightstand and having it set your thing up for the morning and also later speaking directly into the tiny horrible apple tv remote to say okay it's movie time to start a movie although i'm not quite sure what it does if you just say it's movie time does it pick a random movie anyway um <laughs> those those are both examples of speaking good morning what <laughs> See, i knew i shouldn't have activated that thing that i just said but i did activate it on my phone what i, I have never working? had a hawaii <laughs> telephone enabled until very very recently uh and now i'm going to turn <laughs> this is all staying in by the oh, way this absolutely. is totally staying in <laughs> anyway why do you turn uh, that on I turned it on to see if I turned it on to, as an aside. I turned it on uh, like a week or so ago because I'm like, look, everyone else has this on in their phone, and I've had it no. off for exactly the, for exactly I, the <laughs> reason you would think you would have it off because I never wanted it to accidentally activate. But very frequent. Well, this gets to the point of this thing. Um, I have a cylinder that listens to me in my home now, <laughs> and I like the idea that I can just say things into the air. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe that kind of relationship with my phone is just there waiting for me, and I've been too stubborn by keeping this feature off since it was introduced and like literally never turning it on, never even trying it because it just sounded awful to me. So I should really give it a chance. And in this week or two that I've had it on, I have used it consciously about once. And now I have triggered it accidentally once. That's the first time I've ever accidentally triggered it. Cause what occasion do I have to say that with my phone nearby? Um, but for this, for this video showing speaking, not to the air, but to a device that you know is nearby, whether it's a remote in your hand or a phone on your, your nightstand, 
is to me different than just yelling into the air not yelling or just speaking into the air the way you do with the cylinders and all the other things that are in this video and uh, of all, like a lot of using the the home kit thing on on control center the third screen over whatever the hell it is maybe it's the second i don't know um and pressing those rectangles to say i'm here i'm doing this i want to do that change to this mode which is fine like it's good to have buttons for all this stuff uh but like scott mcdulty says in his tweet Anybody who has cylinders that listen to you when you talk in the air, like that is the killer feature to be able to just stroll around and just say something and have it do things, whether it's asking it to set a timer or asking it what the weather's going to be tomorrow or telling it to turn the lights on or off or whatever phrases you enter into the thing, like just getting used to being able to say that. And even for our thing, like the stupid stuff of asking it how to spell things and multiply and divide numbers like or, or, or define things or say something in a particular language. I don't have to wonder, is my phone in this room? Uh, will it hear me from that distance? Will I be able to hear it? Uh, you know, or, or if multiple phones are in the room and they all have that feature whose name I'm not going to say activated on it, will they all wake <laughs> up and start trying to answer at the same time and everything like that? The cylinders simplify all of this. And so this video, I kind of feel the same way. This video basically says, hey, we at Apple have home automation. It's massively less convenient than the cylinders you talk to. But it exists, and if you like tapping buttons, boy, is this a thing for you. And I feel like they're really, <laughs> they're really missing the boat on this type of home automation. Um, and it makes me think, once again, that as silly as these little cylinders are, everyone who gets one ends up liking it for something. Like, they, they end up liking it more than they thought they would, because it certainly seems pretty dumb. And even if they only use one tiny corner of the functionality, that tiny corner functionality becomes an important part of their life and that i think shows a successful product so i think apple not having something like this for such a long time either because they're coming up with the super duper uber awesome one that's going to be way better than everybody else's and cost twice as much or because they just think it's it's a dumb idea i I think they're missing the boat and this website is like a giant advertisement for them missing the boat yeah because like you know as more people get these devices too like Timing to the market is kind of important here. There is a significant first mover advantage because once you have, you know, a couple of these cylinders in your house from one of the brands that sells them, if Apple's comes out and is just a little bit better, no one's going to buy it. Like the only, it has to be massively better to get people who have already bought into these systems to convert over. And, and like you know, like right now, like I I have the Amazon ecosystem. Uh, I have a, a short cylinder in my office and a tall cylinder in the kitchen. <laughs> and you know, and when the Google Home came out, I you know I heard what most people said about, it, and I I was initially interested. Uh, but then once everyone once all the reviews came out and basically said like, yeah, it's fine. It, it's just about as good as the Amazon Echo. It's not you know massively better or worse. Uh, it's about the same. Uh, better in some ways, worse in others, but about the same overall. Uh, then. I immediately lost any interest in ever trying it because I thought, well, you know, you know, I, I already have one. It's all set up. I have all my all my integration set up. I'm I'm habituated to saying its commands and and using it to control stuff in my house and and play music and stuff. So why why would I switch if the other thing is not massively better? And so if Apple comes out with their version of the Amazon Echo or Google Home or whatever else, and it's you know Siri in a can, like it then. It has to be way, way better for me to care and for anyone who's bought any of these devices to care. And I think the chances of that are just not that great. Seeing how Siri actually is and has been today in the competitive landscape um, and and seeing Apple's recent, um, you know, kind of accessory hardware in the $200 range, uh, like the Apple TV uh, or them killing the airport base stations, like seeing their efforts in in this kind of area uh, recently, it just doesn't fill me with confidence that if they do one of these things that it's going to be massively better than what what we already have so it's probably just going to be roughly the same if not worse and as you said twice as expensive probably so i don't really see that going anywhere i i think the typical apple um you know the, the pattern of sitting back and kind of waiting until everyone has like version two and then rolling out the the amazing apple one that might not work here uh, I, I think that might just be more like what we see with the Apple TV, which is some people buy it. You know, the the really devoted Apple fans buy it, but it doesn't have mass market success uh, because it's just, you know, more expensive than everything else, but not better enough and possibly even not better. 
the one thing by all accounts that Apple is doing better than its competitors is security. Like being very careful about who they partner with and having very strict requirements on security and privacy. Surely they are better on privacy than Google and Amazon are. Uh, although uh, there was that case where was it some some law enforcement agency was trying to subpoena audio recordings from Amazon Echo or something. And Amazon, I think this was Amazon, did fight them on it and said, no, you can't have our stuff. And they're trying to like get get that audio classified in a way that it makes it uh, not available without a warrant and all these other things, right? So but there are a lot of security implications to all these devices, which at this point, you just have to accept that you are compromising uh, security in some way by using any of these things. And Apple with HomeKit seems to be trying to avoid silly situations where a vendor integrates with you and does something extremely lax uh, when it comes to security and, and uh, you know has some obvious flaw that either makes devices in your houses into botnets or into spy devices and stuff like that um and that's good like good in general because apple tends to be good on security and privacy but so far consumers have shown no willingness to value <laughs> privacy in their purchase decisions like that is not a differentiating not enough of a differentiating factor uh you know, even even in the phone space, like Apple is, is very good on privacy and security with its phones. But I don't think that's why people are buying iPhones like they're buying them because they like iPhones and it's a nice to have and it's a perk or whatever. But like people are voting with their wallets by buying, you name it, light bulbs, televisions, cylinders that you talk to with terrible security and privacy that like literally intentionally spy on you and record everything you say and do and, and then sell it to people. And everyone's like, eh, oh, well, whatever. TV works. Looks nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, so it's not that, that that's how the market is working right now. And what, what can you do if people don't value it, don't value it? Do we need to change something for people to value it? Do we need a new generation of people in the aftermath of some terrible privacy related thing to uh, deal with this? Are we, are we just happy to leave it to the legal system to say like, well, people get hacked and hacking is illegal. And if it happens, you know, someone will stop them, someone, someone, but blah, blah, blah big sky theory no one cares about what i'm doing anyway so i'll just buy this vizio tv and get spied on or whatever it is you know <laughs> um and it's true it's true of the google cylinder that i have it's probably true of the amazon ones and it's you know we ex- uh, we accept it for the trade-offs even marco uh famous paranoid uh privacy advocate who won't put pre-compiled binaries into his application is willing to trade <laughs> a devices in his house constantly recording him for the convenience of saying something and have his lights go out at night well and to be fair i'm that i'm risking my own personal privacy with that one and then you know it's very different from risking the privacy of my entire customer base of my app you're, you're trading you're trading the thing that you can trade which like it seems like a fair trade to you. you're like well no one really cares about me and whatever and i get this convenience and you weigh them and you're like well convenience wins in this case right you know i don't have any of these devices in the house like i said earlier and i've only interacted with them a couple of times and i don't think i get it like it's neat i suppose but i don't know i don't I, I, this is like the old man portion of the show and i'm surprised it took us this long to get here but i don't really see how getting up and walking a few paces to turn a light <laughs> is so terrible like and i know i know that makes me an old man i know that makes me backwards and ridiculous i understand you that. can't write a letter on a piece of paper and walk right. to the mailbox is the mailbox <laughs> too far away you gotta have this electronic <laughs> messages <laughs> oh, no, no, I completely agree with you. And if and if the roles were reversed, I would be saying the exact same thing to you. Like, it's just this. I, I, I know I say this a lot, and I'm always wrong. And so I'm sure this is another time. But this fills a need that I don't feel like I have. Fast forward to six months from now, I'm going to have probably a, a an, an Amazon cylinder, a Google cylinder, and maybe even an Apple cylinder. And I'll love all of them in their own special way. There'll be my 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 children at that point. But sitting here now, I just I it, there's no integration. There's no thing that i uh, that i can see today that makes me want one of them and and i bet you anything if if one showed up at the house i would end up loving it but it's just it's even this video i i I watched it and thought well yeah that's cool but i i don't it's not it's solving problems i don't think i have it's like any of those things where you don't know you have the need until you have it and it's not going to be like a life-changing thing like the iphone was like Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. but but i i feel like everyone who has one like we use ours less than i thought i would because basically i was betting on google uh making their product better faster than they actually are so oh well better me if only you had friends who told you beforehand to pick the other one i don't (laughs) think i would use the other one anymore um because i i think it's basically a wash at this point um but anyway apparently here's here's yeah 
you know, because it does, it, it is really good at the things that it does do. Um, but eventually, once you realize these things are there and start to get into the mindset, what was it? Like, we're sitting down, ours is within earshot uh, when we sit down to dinner. And we're sitting down to dinner trying to think of, uh, talking about some songs that someone heard. And because I subscribe to Google Play Music, another reason, by the way, that I wouldn't want an Apple one is that I would it would make me have to subscribe to Apple Music to do what I'm about to describe. We're having some discussion about a song, and I can just say into the air, I can just request into the air for that song to be played, almost any song right, to be played, and it just starts playing it. Because we were having a discussion of what the lyrics were and how it sounds, and the kids wanted to hear it, and no one has to get up from the table or pull out their phone and try to search for the song. I just say something into the air before you could even get your phone out of your pocket, and the song is playing. And that is a weird future world thing that I think is awesome. And is it a big deal? And is it a need? No, it's not. But for the $110 or whatever I pay for the stupid cylinder to be able to say words into the air and have the song that I requested play immediately, I think that's like worth the price of entry. Uh, even if I only do that once every week and a half and the rest of the time my kids are just asking how to say things in foreign languages, like this is all this is all <laughs> bonus. Now, it's not, again, not a life-changing thing, but once you get used to the idea that something is constantly listening to your house and can conceivably do things that you find useful, it's hard to go back to the idea that nothing is listening and you have to actually pick something up and hit it with your fingers because there is a big difference in how it feels to do something it's kind of like the difference between how it feels to pull out your phone and look something up versus how it would feel to get in your car and drive to the library and look something up. And now this is, you know, that's interesting. It's like, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's an exponential type thing where like, obviously the library on is way longer than the looking at the phone. But now like how much, how much longer is, uh, saying something into the air to your phone? It's probably like a couple of seconds, a couple minutes, but man, it feels, it feels so different. And, mm -hmm. You just can't go back to the other way. And if you wanted to go ho full home automation, everything and hook stuff up to it and do all stuff like that, I feel like you're starting to get into tech gadget land uh, at that point. But but that can be awesome too, especially if it's like a hobby to have a house where you can just say things and have it do stuff and work with your rhythms. Um, there's, I, I think these devices can be enjoyed at many levels. And as we said last time we discussed this, most importantly, they're all freaking cheap in the grand scheme of things. Like. They're not $3, but they're also not $2,000 like a new MacBook, right? You can get one of these. You can buy all of these. You can put them around. What is the dot one? What is the short cylinder, Marco? It's like, it's like 40 bucks. Somewhere. 40 bucks. Yeah, it's really cheap. You can get one of these things, you know, on a whim just to see if you might like it and throw it somewhere. And if you never use it, you're like, oh, well, it's $40. It's like a nice meal for one person. Like, whatever. You know, to, to answer your earlier question, Case, like, you know, you don't see what you know, why it would be a big deal to have faster light switches or something. The answer is that there's there's like one thing that gets most owners in the door. And for for most people I've talked to and been around and seen be converted, including myself, uh, that one thing is music. You know, it's like what John said, like it really is awesome to be able to just say, Alexa, play fish and have that just work you, for all of our you listeners. You did that on purpose, you mm. terrible terrible troll. Not the first time. That or you know and you can say, you know, hey cylinder, play rock music from the 90s or like there are, it's it's just really really nice to have that. Like there's a reason why like places like Sonos are having trouble now. Like anything that is involved in the high-end audio scene for tech geeks that is not voice controlled is having problems right now because it's once once you get into vo the voice controlled music it is so awesome. Especially like when, you know, if you're having like friends over for dinner or something else and you just have it playing and you can just and anybody can just say, you know, next song or pause or volume up or whatever else and or people can call out their own requests. Like it's fun. It becomes a cool, a pretty cool thing. the The Echo is not a great speaker. It's only an okay speaker. Literally, like in my house, it is sitting right next to a Sono speaker that is way, way better sounding. And the Sono speaker almost never gets used anymore because it is just so much more convenient to use the Echo for music purposes. And so, anyway, you know what gets someone in is usually one cool thing that they like see or hear about, and they're like, "Oh my god, I want it for that." But then once you already have the cylinder in your house and set up and everything, then when, you know, Black Friday comes around and these the switchable outlets go on sale for like 20 bucks, you're like, hey, 
let me try one of those you know and then and then <laughs> and then you, and you try one and you're like oh that that ends up like there's that one lamp it's the total other side of the room and i turn it off every night and every night i have to walk over there and turn it off and what if i didn't have to walk over there i'd save like five seconds a night and that could add up and then next time they're on sale you get three or four more of them because you realize how useful they are and then all of a sudden you can say a turn off everything and all of your lights turn off and when you're going up to bed and you have a glass of water in one hand and maybe some laundry or a dog in the other hand and you don't have any hands to go hit all the light switches before you go upstairs you can just say hey turn off everything and five things turn off at once and you just walk upstairs and it becomes pretty cool and so it's that's how you get into this it's it is not that you can't walk over and hit a light switch but once you have one of these technologies for some other reason like music then it's and you know as all the like you know home automation things just start getting really cheaper you know like the, you know you can when you can go on go and get these switchable outs for like 20 bucks or whatever or or you can have other integrations through web services through like if to and various services like that and you know warm up your car or you can you casey you have your garage door thing you can like open and close your garage door by voice like once you are in the system for some other compelling reason like music you will start having these other things trickle in and you'll be like, wait a minute, this is kind of awesome. And none of it's necessary. Like you could operate your house without these things. But once you get into the, once you have, have a taste of this, it's just really nice. Again, it's not, it's not a must have. We can all send post, send letters to the post office if we want to. (laughs) But once you have something nicer, it is pretty great. Yeah, it's funny you uh, bring up, but both of you bring up the music thing, because when I tried Apple Music during the free trial when it first came out, the one thing I, I deeply missed about Apple Music was being able to say to Siri, you know, play Mute Math or whatever the case may be, and, and just have it happen. And that was super cool. And it was almost enough to get me to pay for Apple Music rather than Spotify, which I prefer for reasons that are irrelevant. Um, but th- all the other things that I preferred about Spotify were enough to keep me away away from Apple Music. And, and I guess that's the difference is with the garage door opener, as an example, I immediately understood why having an internet connected garage door opener could immediately improve or improve maybe a strong word, but, but I can't think of a better one, improve my life. Whereas the cylinders, I don't doubt that they would make things better in all the ways you described, but there's less of a visceral, tangible need that I can see sitting here now. And I'm sure the time will come that I will get one. And I'm sure I'll be on this show saying, by God, what was I thinking? Of course I wanted this. But uh, sitting here now, ignorance is less. Wow. You know, it does take it does take some time to actually figure out what you think it's going to be good for. Um, after you just play with it and find the limits of the thing. And I think it really, it really is situational. Like it's not, it's not as if you have to like, uh, every day I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to use this thing to do the thing, like getting a new like device into your life and incorporating into some task you have to do. Like for me, that hasn't, that's not how my experience of having this thing. It's more like developing an awareness that this thing is there so that when a need comes up that you reflexively satisfy in other ways, eventually you come to remember I don't have to do that. I can just say this question into the air and get an answer. Even if it's like dividing two numbers or converting like table teaspoons into cups or whatever, like all those things are things I've done my whole life. And you're like, oh, I don't remember the conversions. Let me check or whatever. And you can always like pick up your phone or ask someone in the house who you think knows the conversion or, you know, all, all these other th- ways you have to solve this problem. Eventually, what the most important thing you need to have is. Uh, it, you know a deep grain instinctive awareness that i can say this thing into the air and get an answer right and that's the hardest part because you will find yourself pulling out your phone and typing into google you know how many teaspoons in a cup and you'll do that and maybe do that without even realizing you could have just asked that question but eventually it sinks in it sinks in after some incidents of like arguing about the lyrics to the song over dinner and realizing we can settle this in 30 seconds i can just request that song by title it will immediately start playing and we can all listen to it together right um, or not remembering who, you know, what year someone was born or who, what album this thing was on or what, like we could all take out our phones and look it up. We all know how to do that. It's like, you could do that. Or you could just like put a little trigger phrase that I'm not going to say in front of that same question you were just asking each other and instantly get some kind of answer. Um, and 
it can go too far where, you know, we have the recent rash of the Google, what is it, the Google answer thing where it tries to answer the question definitively at the top of search results and it just throws mm-hmm. out bogus stuff that has no uh, foundation and truth, right? And all these devices, again, there are security concerns and privacy concerns and everything, but it is a glimpse of the as yet uh, unperfected, unrealized future. And like all gadget tech geeks, we all like to sort of see what that future is going to be like and try living it, even if it is pretty rough at this point, just because we think there's value in it. And whatever form it takes in the future, I think this type of interface has proved its worth, that it has to be part of the various ways we interact with technology and networks, right? All the other ones have proved their worth, and they're not going to go away and be completely replaced with this. But this, I feel like, has definitively proved its worth. It's just a question of how it fits in with all the other ways that we, you know, use computing devices and, and connect to networks and stuff. We're brought to you this week by Squarespace. Make your next move with a beautiful website from Squarespace. Enter offer code ATP at checkout to get 10% off. Squarespace lets you build websites Beautiful, professionally designed websites full of functionality. Everything from a simple content site to a blog to a gallery to a portfolio to even a full-blown store where you sell physical or digital goods. Squarespace can do all of that. And it does it while looking amazing for you. Both the interface you use and the the interface everyone else sees, first of all, it looks almost the same because it's really like a what-you-see-is-what-you-get environment. But then your site just looks so good with their professionally designed templates that you can very, very easily customize if you want to. Uh, with all this drag and drop stuff and little live previews and what you see is what you get. It is so nice to make websites with Squarespace. And it's so easy. It is so much easier than how it used to be to do any of this stuff. Whether it's making a simple blog or a podcast or setting up a whole store. With Squarespace, you just click a few buttons and it's basically done. They support it if you need any help. They have rock-solid hosting. I highly recommend that you check out Squarespace for your next project. It is so easy to do. You will wonder why you ever did anything else to make a website. Go to squarespace.com. Start a free trial site today with no credit card required. See how far you get. I say try it for an hour. Next time you need to make a site for you or someone else, try it for an hour. See how far you get. And I bet by the end of that hour, you will love Squarespace so much you'll sign up. And when you do sign up, use offer code ATP to get 10% off your first purchase. Thank you very much to Squarespace for supporting this show. Make your next move with Squarespace. So YouTube also, uh, almost a month ago now, has announced uh, YouTube TV, which means for $35 a month, subscribers get all four major networks, ABC, CBS, Fox, and NBC, and around 30 of the biggest cable channels. And that price covers six accounts, so each member of the house can have a personalized account that offers recommendations tuned to their taste. I'm reading mostly from The Verge's uh, coverage of this. Uh, It will be missing channels from Viacom, including big names like Comedy Central and MTV. It also won't have uh, programming from Turner, which means you won't get CNN, TBS, TNT, AMC, Discovery, and A&E. But this, as someone who is not really looking to cut the cord, this does sound pretty compelling to me. I don't really have a good feel for what the landscape is for cord cutters um, because I, I'm not even really considering it at the moment. But this sounds really good. Uh, Marco, I know you're not really that into broadcast TV, but I, I believe you've cut the cord. So are you interested in this at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I the last time I had cable was about 10 years ago. Uh, and I, I don't say this to like, to super brag in the hipsterist way possible, just a fact. Um, I've, you know, since then, I, I've gotten into the habit of just not having these TV channels. I do get and buy TV content in other ways, uh, like, I don't, like through iTunes and stuff, although honestly, I cannot leave Apple TV purchasing fast enough. Like, as, as Top Chef wrapped up on one more season, I still can't believe how bad buying tv series on apple tv is and then watching them and all the different things that don't work or that work poorly or that actually spoil the show like the auto-generated thumbnails of the last chance kitchen (sighs) but you know i've kind of gotten into the world now of not having cable and so to to buy access to all these channels to me it doesn't really sound that appealing because i i kind of don't need them anymore or i've trained myself not to uh, have them anymore so the idea of buying access to all these 
things so I can like watch broadcast TV and sports, not although with a bunch of asterisks and stuff like that. It is advertising a a collection of services that I have gone without for ten years. That that I have already yeah. like I I this is not something I really am that excited about for myself. I do think it is it is a good idea for people who have been maintaining a cable subscription all this time for one of these things or for multiple of these things. Like lots of people, you know, have like for example, sports fans. Like most <laughs> a lot of sports fans or people who just like to watch like live news or who like to watch some shows that are on one of the on one of these networks that just aren't available easily or affordably uh, elsewhere online, at least legally. So for those people, this is a great this is you know a good good idea it's, it seems like a pretty reasonable price this 35 bucks a month for all this stuff uh now i'm curious what what form does this take is it is it like just a tv stream and therefore you have to like skip commercials and crap or is it more like on demand where you just pick what you want to watch and there's no commercials i'm not sure the way i read this was it's that it would basically exist within youtube but i i could have that dreadfully wrong i'm not entirely sure yeah, because like they make, they make mention of things like a, a DVR style recording with unlimited storage space in Google's cloud and the ability to skip over ads. So that kind of sounds like it's more like watching a broadcast, and you just you know it's kind of like with a broadcast with DVR style controls, but you'd still have to like fast forward through the ads. So it's kind of weird to see YouTube as the company sort of. Uh, I don't know if they're very first out of the gate, but one of the first of the big names to do what everyone's been referring to was. Uh, this is the skinny bundle thing where it's a subset of the stuff that you can buy in cable with the idea that people who pay for cable, nobody wants all those channels. Like everyone just wants a subset of it. So if we could sell you a subset of it for a cheaper price, um, then that would be a more desirable product for you. And we could get you onto our platform and stop you paying for cable or <laughs> stop you paying for cable, stop you paying for television programming for cable. Because once again, the whole cord cutter thing makes about as much sense as debating which parts of a game engine are done in software and in hardware doesn't really mean anything when you look at the phrasing because oh i'm cutting the cord i'm going to get all my video content over a cable that comes to my house that delivers data but it doesn't count because it's internet and not cable television (laughs) and oh it's you know totally different thing anyway um comcast would still sell you your internet access or verizon or whoever sell your internet access but you were just like no thanks i don't want to pay for your cable television bundle i just want the internet i'll pay you for that and then over the internet i will get things like youtube tv but anyway it's ironic that youtube is doing it because as far as my children are concerned youtube is television they, they <laughs> barely watch television anymore They watch YouTube on their iOS devices because that's what they have. If they didn't, they would watch on anything else. Television, like, I don't think they know what ABC, CBS, Fox, and NBC are. I don't think they recognize those sequence of three letters. If we put them in sequence and say, what are these three letters? They would not be able to identify. They have no idea. Like, they watch watch enough television. They sure have seen enough television shows in their life, but their entire interface of television, A, is through my TiVo. So there is no, you know, again, trying to ch- trying to explain to them or young, young children, the concept of live television is extremely difficult. It's the, mo- the, the task of modern parenting, right, to explain to your, to explain to your toddler what live television is and why you can't, like, fast forward or pause or anything like that. You're like, no, this, this is happening now. This is live. Like, or we can't watch this because it hasn't aired yet. Like, it's going to come on at 7. It's like, what are you even saying, Dad? I don't understand. <laughs> like, I don't understand these words. Eddie, like, and they, they're like, no, Dad, let me explain it to you. You just go like this, and you tap over here. And, and but just why isn't it working? I think it's broken. I'm like, no, it hasn't hasn't aired yet. It's it's difficult. <laughs> anyway, this is a difficult thing to explain, right? So YouTube, it seems, has the future locked up, and yet they are the ones out of the gate to say we're going to try to get the olds by giving them something that makes them feel more comfortable. And you pay us thirty five dollars a month, and we will resell you this content with a nice kind of interface that makes it look like you have a TiVo, but you don't. And you know some some uh fashion of on demand type stuff and also with you know ad skipping and so on and so forth but like all these deals like the reason it has always been said that apple hasn't had this deal has, hasn't had a deal like this despite them pursuing it for many years now is that they could never they can never get you know presumably according to apple satisfaction an arrangement of content and price that they that apple like that apple said yes that's what we want to go to market with so they've come to market with nothing and all these things, if you look at them, it's like, oh, well, you got all this stuff, but you don't have all that stuff. Is that is this the right price and combination of content? Like, 
if you got this and you'd be like, I'm going to replace cable. And then you just realize, like, I, I'm trying to think of a show that's on AMC. Like, Mad Men used to be. What's on AMC now? Um, how the Americans is the Americans FX. Anyway, if if you get this and you're like, this will be just like cable. We can just pick the channels we want. But you realize you can't get some of these things at any price. Oh, uh, The Walking Dead is on AMC. Uh, Better Call Saul. Um you realize you can't get them at any price that can be a deal breaker if you know it's like well i guess we'll just stick with cable because cable despite the fact that cable is making you pay like you know three dollars a month for espn that you never watch or whatever the hell the number is these days um you have access to everything essentially because cable is a mature industry and everything is resold through cable subscriptions and if you're willing to pay enough money you can get everything uh to get a skinny bundle like okay well i'll skinny bundle for this and then i will just pay on itunes for the walking dead the day after it comes out or i'll watch game of thrones on hbo go or now and hope that it doesn't get overwhelmed by people and like that's the other thing with these skinny bundles you can be really sad if game of thrones premieres and you can't watch it because of some networking thing whereas if you had cable it would have quote unquote just worked right because it's broadcast versus you know uh database television which has all the problems of any uh you know database solution um so I, I don't know if they're striking the right balance. And honestly, I think YouTube shouldn't care that much if they're striking the right balance because they sure as heck seem to be the future of television as far as any of my children are concerned. And honestly, I'm watching more YouTube than I used to. Like, yeah, same uh, here. You know, like as in subscribing to channels and looking for content to come on them. Um, so they I think this is a good move for YouTube. It's like we are already at the forefront of this new thing. And you know what? We can scrape up some of those old things. And they're not so picky about, oh, we can't we can't go to market with this skinny bundle because not enough people will buy it because it doesn't have CNN and TBS. Like or, or A and E and AMC or whatever. Like they're just like, whatever, we'll go for it. We'll see how it goes. If it doesn't, whatever, we're the future. We're, we'll be fine. Whereas <laughs> Apple is still waiting for this beautiful, perfect deal that has extremely low prices and the right amount of control for Apple and can provide the right experience. And so they just have nothing. They just have nothing to offer. They have this TV app that you know looks like it's a ghost town, and you can kind of see a glimmer of what it was supposed to be. But what it is now is nothing compared to YouTube. Nothing compared to YouTube TV. So Apple is uh, is not doing well here, and Netflix and Amazon and YouTube definitely seem to be the future of video content for an entire generation of people, whether they be, you know, young children or millennials or whatever, who just accept that, you know, the content they want probably isn't on TV, uh, unless it's, you know, live news or, or sports stuff like that. And even, even that, like those will be the last ones to come over, but the future looks dim for the old model of television in all aspects. And these skinny bundles entirely seem like a, a transitional thing to get people over the hump to the to the new system um and the more of them that are out there the more people they'll pull over and like marco eventually like once you do it and realize the world doesn't come to an end and you just get used to that kind of lifestyle and accept whatever the limitations may be during the transitional period it's hard to go back like you rarely hear about people who cut the cord try it for a year and then immediately go back i mean maybe they do if there's if there's a disagreement in the house about the the how important local live sports are and and uh uh, a misprediction of what a blackout would really mean to your life but beyond that i feel like the people who who unsubscribe from cable television especially in tech nerd circles they find alternate uh arrangements and are are happy with it eventually like that it, it's that it is a successful transition it's kind of like the people by the cylinders you're not quite sure what's going to work out but you get it and in the end it's better than you thought it would be one thing that that is somewhat appealing to me about these new uh digital based services though is that there's no equipment and that you could probably pretty easily start and stop your service. In the past, like if there was like a big event of some kind, like like watching, you know, a presidential election return or um, you know, a really important news event or a really important TV show that I was super into that I couldn't get any other way, like it would be kind of a bummer to not have cable for brief periods in my life. And I would occasionally think maybe we should just get it again and just never use it. And then, but like it, it, the idea of having to like call up a local cable company or whatever and have them you know schedule an appointment and have them come to the house during this eight hour window that usually becomes more than that, and they come at the very end of it except for that one time where they came early, so you can't really plan for it. And then they install this giant box that may or may not work. If you want any kind of DVR functionality, you need to deal with either another giant box like the Syracuse method 
or you just deal with their crappy giant box with their d- crappy DVR. You got to learn all the controls all over again. You got another remote hanging around the house with this giant box and this, uh, you know, all this overhead of starting and then later stopping that service. Like, if you want to stop that service, you got to call them on the phone, which I will do quite a lot to avoid. <laughs> call them <laughs> on the phone, talk to some customer service rep, convince, if, in the case of some of these morally bankrupt companies like Comcast, convince them to please, for the love of God, let you cancel your service, which you may or may not succeed at, that may or, that may, or may not take a very long time to convince them. Uh, then have that whole process in reverse scheduling dealing with the equipment whether you like got to like drop it off somewhere or have them come pick it up and disconnect the wire like it's a big pain in the butt and then they probably have restrictions on like how often you can sign up or disconnect your service again or like you know and then you know, all, there's all this basically bs involved in starting and stopping cable tv service so to have these internet based ones where it's probably just like you know, clicking a few buttons and entering a credit card into the YouTube app. And then when you want to stop it, you, you know, go go through some screens and there's probably an all digital way to do it where you probably don't have to talk to anybody on the phone. Uh, that is actually probably a really good thing for the cable industry. Uh, it's not good in the sense that it becomes easier to stop your service, but, but I think it is good in that for people like me who don't have it most of the time, but occasionally have some reason why we might want it, I think you're more likely to win people like us over because the barrier to entry is now lower than it was before. So that, I I think, is a big new good feature of this. However, that being said, you know, what John said about the channel availability is a big deal. Uh, It includes, like, you know, the big broadcast numbers, but for 35 bucks a month, that's like a basic cable plan. And it does not include Comedy Central, MTV, CNN, TBS, TNT, AMC, A&E, Discovery. (laughs) It's like this huge list of channels that come in pretty much every standard cable bundle in the U.S. for like 20 years, uh, and they don't come with this. And that kind of thing, like, in the regular cable market... Like whether you're, when when you're like you know choosing between like uh, in one of the various satellite companies like you know, like Directv or Dish or whatever if you have like if you you choose between like that or like Comcast or FiOS or whatever your local cable thing is, uh, oftentimes like one of these networks will be missing from one of these services and that'll be enough to get people to choose the other one. So to have this many things missing, that's really a, a pretty big uh, problem, I think. So this specific service at this specific time with this specific set of deals that they made, uh, having such limited channel options, that's going to really hurt them, I think. But the idea of this kind of bundle, I, I think, is strong if anybody can get all the deals in place or even just some of the deals. <laughs> so just get more than what YouTube got. <laughs> We are sponsored this week by Betterment, investing made better. To learn more, visit Betterment.com slash ATP. Betterment is the world's largest automated investing service. And what this means is unlike traditional financial services where you often pay high commissions, Betterment is focused on bringing lower fees to everyone. They make investing easier and available at a lower cost. These are the same strategies that financial advisors use with clients who have millions of dollars And now Betterment makes us available to everyone at much lower cost than traditional financial services. Betterment cares about its clients. This is shown through how transparent the investing process is, which is unlike much of the investment world that just had to make more money, often recommending investments that they make hidden commissions and fees from. Uh, You might have heard about Betterment in the press, such as in the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, and TechCrunch. They are so good that they've won awards for their customer experience. Investing involves risk. For a limited time, sign up for Betterment and you may qualify for a free Canary home security system to help secure your home. For terms and conditions, visit Betterment.com slash ATP. Betterment, investing made better. Now we enter the uh, hardware portion of the program. So I don't know which one of you wants to kick this off, but uh, Intel is going 14 nanometers one more time, apparently. Remember when they had the TikTok strategy and we talked about that? Mm-hmm. And then it became TikTok thud or whatever? They changed it to mm-hmm. this TikTok. Well, I forget what they're thinking. Like, it's not TikTok anymore. It's like, I'm going to find like a diagram. PAO or like, something, process architecture optimization? Right. 
Uh, and it was because basically like, oh, we used to, you know, we do, we do a process shrink, then we do an architecture and then we do a process shrink, then we do an architecture. And it was kind of on a yearly basis, but either way, that was their cadence. Right. Uh, and they're like, oh, we can't, we can't sustain that anymore because every time we try to do a new process, it's taking longer and longer. So to try to get from 14 nanometer to 10 or whatever the next one is, it's taking longer than we thought. So we're going to do a process shrink, we're going to do an architecture, and then we're going to optimize that architecture. So basically give us another year to get to the shrink. The new strategy is process, architecture, optimize, and you know what? Let's optimize again because we don't have <laughs> we don't have the new process size ready to go and it's kind of comical to see them change their tick tock strategy to a three-step strategy to a four-step strategy it's sort of it's like a it's like a little kid stalling on uh, on getting their assignment done it's like well <laughs> my new strategy is let's wait another year um and <laughs> you, you try to look and see what like our so you know KB Lake is not that big of a deal uh, of an enhancement, uh, as we've discussed in the past, things like some some uh, video DRM stuff in there and some minor tweaks, but it's not, you know, like, it, it is technically an optimization of of a pre-existing thing, but, and maybe the next one they will optimize more, but we're kind of used to, even even in this, you know, age of the, uh, the dwindling returns on uh, Morris Law, used to the idea that we will get... A, a bigger jump in uh, CPU capabilities and uh, with with a process shrink. And if that process shrink just never seems to come, it's like, well, what can we really do? Like, we did a really good job in this architecture to begin with this process size. The biggest bang for the buck historically has been, uh, you know, how can we d- decrease power and get more transistors to do stuff with and, you know, like, make different choices? The shrink gives you that headroom to do it, provided you can figure out how to make it work. Uh in lieu of a shrink, you are left with the same power budget and the same number of transistors and just making different trade-offs, basically, or just being a little bit smarter about a few components. And you can make things better that way, but you can't make them better in the, not that they're giant leaps, but, you know, to to get a double-digit percent increase in almost anything is a very big effort within a given uh, process size, especially in an architecture that's already pretty well optimized, right? So... This I'm not gonna say this is disappointing, but it is further evidence of the slowing rate of advancement at the uh, at the edges of hardware on, on, on cutting edge hardware. Like, what is the best process size you can get? In, you know, in a processor, in a sophisticated processor, for any amount of money, and for another year in a row, it's going to be 14 nanometers. I mean, really, like, these days, like, an Intel delay is not news. Like, when Intel delays the next big thing for a year, that used to, like, shake the industry. These days, it's kind of more surprising when they don't. And I think, I'm pretty sure they're still ahead of most other people, because other people are like, yeah, we're excited we have a 14 nanometer process. Like, this is, Intel's going to be on its third year of 14 nanometer. It's like, well, welcome to the club, right? And I guess that lead only counts if they get to the next size before everyone else, too. Uh, but I'm... I'm guessing they will. I'm guessing this is not like Intel incompetence. It is merely that it is getting much, much harder as the sizes get much smaller, as we discussed on past shows. Moore's Law cannot continue forever as far as our understanding of the physical world is aware because you cannot subdivide matter into ever smaller pieces. Uh, At a certain point, you reach a size where you can't break it into any smaller sizes without super high energy physics and stuff. So inevitably, eventually, everyone's favorite infinite timeline argument Moore's law cannot mm. continue, right? Because if you keep having the size of things and you're down to like quarks and stuff, like no, um, even getting down just the size of individual atoms, the whole functioning of the way we manufacture transistors stops working, and we're already getting into all sorts of thing uh, problems uh, on the future sizes we're doing. So it will end. It's just a question of what does the slope look like as we slide down into the doomsday scenario of CPUs that never get any better. And wait for quantum computing to save us all with an entirely new paradigm. But either way, um, this is not the type of story that I want to read. I guess another old man story I'll be able to tell is like when I was a kid, computers would get massively faster every year. And it was amazing. (laughs) I remember those days. Not anymore. Doom Doom on a Pentium. It was like, can any computer be this fast? How is it possible? (laughs) Last year, this game was barely usable, and now it goes faster than my eyeballs. And that would happen every year. It's true. All right, tell me about uh, AMD Ryzen. 
So I wish I had more time to read up on this, but uh, we haven't really talked much about AMD on the show. Occasionally we mention them, but like we, you know, in, in the context of uh, Intel alternatives, but we've been doing even less of that. And it's mostly because despite doing very well in the, the glory part of PC CPUs back in the day, the, the Athlon days, remember those? When, oh, yeah. Uh, when AMD was actually giving Intel a run for their money and was, you know, taking a lot of the the crowns in those in this type of sort of speeds and feed measurements contests that were so popular back in the uh back in the 90s what is the best you know cpu for gaming or for whatever and look at these benchmarks and the highest end so on and so forth and amd was doing really well and they were an important player and it was great to see the competition and it forced intel i think to get get off of the net burst architecture in the pentium 4 and come out with the core series which was awesome and then it was like Intel took the lead back and AM and and wiped AMD off the face of the earth. Uh, they came out with the the bulldozer architecture that was not particularly successful and it was a bad choice. And they've always had sort of you know financial problems as compared to the behemoth that is Intel, and you know have never been uh, you know competitive with Intel's fabbing abilities. And so we haven't heard anything about them for a long time. And this seems like their comeback. Like, hey, we're AMD. We still know how to make good cpus uh and so they have a a line of cpus that are competitive like they're not they're not the best in the world they're not like oh these are 10 times better than everything intel has but it's a comeback story and people like a comeback story this this (laughs) company that was not didn't seem to be even be in the race like like people suggesting uh apple should just use amd processors that suggestion stopped many years ago and started to become Apple should get AMD to make a new processor that's better than all of their crappy ones, right? <laughs> to get off, right? Or Apple should work with AMD, or Apple should make its own X80, but all but never like no one's suggesting like, you know what? Mac laptops would be better if they took out the Intel CPUs and used AMD ones instead. Um, and so they have these series of, of uh, CPUs, which are significant mostly because A, it's a comeback and they're, they're actually competitive and good, and B, in the, for the most part, they're cheaper than the Intel alternatives. Um, I don't think any of that. I looked at them briefly to see, is there anything in there that would be great for a Mac Pro? No, they're, they're not Mac Pro caliber things. But they do have a lot of cores for a low price with a reasonable power envelope. Um, and I don't think this means Apple will look at them any more than they did in the past because of ancillary uh, issues and because who knows what Intel's roadmap looks like versus AMD's roadmap. But I'm excited to see AMD back in the mix because despite the fact that Intel seems to be getting its butt kicked all over the map by ARM processors and mobile and everything having to do with that, because all of Intel's mobile efforts have not really gone anywhere and they're not particularly competitive and they're just lucky to get like a radio chip that in uh, Apple's iPhones at this point. And every day they must, uh, I forget who did this. Maybe the CEO had already left, regret the sale of their ARM holdings when they had the X scale processor, the, the ARM things, <laughs> Intel got rid of that because they wanted to do everything X86 anyway um i like seeing a competitor to, for intel on the high end as well because competition is good and i hope this spurs intel to redouble its efforts to stay ahead of the game and to find ways to get more performance and to find ways to get to the next process size and to widen that gap again between them and amd not that i'm saying amd's only purpose in life is to make intel stuff better but for the foreseeable future i don't see apple switching to amd unless they're asking them to make their very own custom chips and so for my purposes uh, amd exists to give pc hobbyists a cool alternative to build pcs with and to make the processors that are going to be in my Macs hopefully better cool sounds about right did it make you want to build a pc no no not what makes bit. you want to build a PC is Xeons. <laughs> so, like, if I ever, like, you know, a lot of people build um, PCs and, like, a lot of the Hackintosh guides and stuff out there uh, and price comparisons are all about this class of hardware. They're about, like, you know, iMac class CPUs, you know, the, the Intel, like, you know, 4000 series with the K on the end. Like, those are really high powered CPUs for desktops. They're really nice. Uh, but, Apple already makes those. They, they they already, you know, ship computers with those and keep them reasonably up to date most of the time. They're called iMacs. And the iMac 5K is a wonderful computer. I'm talking to you on it right now. With the exception of my image retention issues on the, on the display, which everyone says are actually not solved in the most recent ones. Um, with the exception of that, it's uh, it's been a wonderful computer for me. And 
I expect it to serve me still for a little for a while until something faster comes out, which barely really hasn't happened. Um, the problem is I want something faster. I want more than four cores. I, I want you know higher performance than what the consumer line can offer me. So I've only ever been tempted to to build a Hackintosh, not to give myself a cheaper iMac, which I understand why people do that. You know that's that makes sense, um, but to to give me a computer uh, to give me basically a mac that apple does not even sell and that is you know a modern mac pro well you can get it you can get eight core ryzen for 329 dollars hmm. that, that okay is way cheaper than the equivalent eight core intel chip that is true you know i, I don't know I, I, i'd have to i guess i'd take a look at it if, if i was to build a hackintosh I guess I'm just I thinking, like that, for but... Apple, for Apple's purposes, like for an iMac, because again, I don't think any of these are suitable for, uh, as far as I'm aware, for laptop chips or whatever. Intel yeah. still has that wrapped up, but for kind of like the de- what we used to call desktop class CPUs, where it's not the Xeons, but it's not in the power envelope, but like the thing that you could stick in an iMac because it's big and has lots of fans. And what we currently have in the iMac, I think you could get either a better processor in the same envelope or an equally good processor for hundreds less uh, dollars. Uh, going with AMD again, not, not that I think Apple will do this because of ancillary reasons and, and other chipsets and Thunderbolt and, and just general relationships with them. But it shows me that there is once again competition in the market because before GNOME was like, oh, you shouldn't be using that. If we were saying we shouldn't use this particular Intel CPU and iMac, we were saying you should use some other Intel CPU instead. We weren't saying you should use something from AMD or something like that. And now, now you can say that now there's, there's products on the market to say uh, uh, it, Apple here is an alternative for your uh, iMacs. And I know you're probably not going to do it, but what it does show is that Intel perhaps is not serving your needs as well as they could because clearly it is technically and financially possible to make a chip that would make Marco happier. So why don't you do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, most of my problems don't lie with the processor companies. You know, like, they're, Intel's good enough for me. M- my problem lies in Apple's inability to ship hardware. Uh, so does that cover our Xeon Gold then, or no? No. The Xeon Gold is the chip they're supposed to use, but they won't. <sighs> okay. I have not read up on the Xeon Gold, other than the part that I pasted into the show notes. It's Skylake EP. It's the Skylake EP Xeons, which is the the line of chips that would be most appropriate to put in a new Mac Pro. But they're probably not going to do that. So, therefore, I have nothing to... I, I haven't even looked too, too far into these, because in the past, I've looked into what Skylake E was going to have and it it is truly awesome it's wonderful uh but it's just i don't know to to me it's it's kind of even it's almost sad or painful to even read about this processor because i know <laughs> to, that to know this is out there but that you can't buy a machine <laughs> with it in it exactly like it, i i just whatever has been clogging up apple i hope it gets out and <laughs> they start shipping hardware again because something's wrong like something is deeply wrong at that company where where is the where where is all the effort going that's what i want to know because it's sure not going into the mac it's sure not going into the apple tv it's sure not going into the ipad some of it but not much of it is going into the watch like where is it going some of it's going to be the phone obviously but is the entire company only capable of keeping the phone up to date at a reasonable pace which even that is like kind a ton of, of it, i think a ton of it's going into the phone sure a huge but amount of it's going they're into the a phone. big company where the hell is everything else yeah that's yeah, what yeah. i want to know and until until we get self-driving something car software even that like <laughs> that's easily a separatable thing like where is the entire company going <sighs> Something's wrong. That's that's all I can, all I can say is something is deeply wrong and needs to change. But that's I know that's not very helpful. But <laughs> when you when you have when you have a year like 2016 in the product line, something's really really wrong. 2017 has a lot of checks to cash, uh, and we'll see if they do. I hope they do. But we haven't heard a lot of promising info so far to suggest that they will except tim cook's vague promises did you see that thing i retweeted earlier today of someone was doing uh swift compilation benchmarks like how long does it take to compile a bunch of swift <laughs> yeah code? it was linkedin yeah, yeah and and the two core mac mini beat the highest end trash can mac pro yeah i mean granted oh, that's that's because gosh. of like you know problems in the swift compiler i think it's not like that is not because the mac mini is faster i know but it, like here, here's what this shows it, it, it doesn't show the quality of the hardware it shows support for the hardware like obviously there is something not allowing 
the compiler to take advantage of this hardware in the same way that very often there were like weird retina issues with the Mac Pro because it is such a rare machine. And so if people have them that OS support for it and like just in general, the, the software, whether it's the OS or the applications, have no expectation of ever running out of trash can because there's so few of them. So it's not not only is it not optimized for it, but it doesn't even take advantage of the hardware that's there. It's like the worst case scenario of like, you know, you get weird PC hardware, but Windows doesn't support it well. Only this is Apple and this is, you know, they have a limited line of hardware. And like, that's all I've ever heard from uh, Mac Pro, trash can Mac Pro users is that they feel left out of the rest of the Apple ecosystem because all of these software updates and application updates and OS updates pretend that they don't exist. So any weird problems they have don't go away, don't get fixed, and new software doesn't take advantage of all the cores that they have and so on and so forth, which is which is sad because that's exactly how it's supposed to be. You put out this exotic piece of hardware and don't worry about it because you make the OS too and, all the, and a bunch of the applications as well. You can make sure that it is leveraged and that you take advantage of it. And when that doesn't happen, you just have an exotic piece of hardware that, that gets worse over time. And, you know, eventually you got Mac minis beating you in a compilation benchmark. And you're like, why? <laughs> <laughs> no, again, that I really think that's like, you know, Xcode and the compiler having bad settings. But, you know, the, the point, your, your larger point about, you know, maintenance and support does stand. I mean, people say, like, look at Apple. They have all the money in the world. Why can't they do X? Well, you know, it wasn't that long ago that Microsoft had all the money in the world. And they had, like, two decades where they did almost nothing. Microsoft had a very, very long span where they could not produce anything even good, let alone great. Uh, and, it, you know, it's arguable whether they've come out of that yet. But, but you know, they, they're, they're trying. They're, I, they're I doing a lot better now. It. They're doing a lot better than they were, um, like in, in like, the, like, like the Windows Vista era, like first leading up to Vista and then Vista itself. And, you know, it, like Microsoft had all the money in the world, but simply could not manage to ship great things uh, because of other problems, because of mismanagement, because of internal problems, whatever the case was, App or Microsoft had just no ability to apply their money into creating good products reliably. And I think we are at that point now with Apple. It is very, very hard to, to look at the output of Apple over the last couple of years and say otherwise. They're a company that can produce good things sometimes, but increasingly that's the exception not the norm and that's really really worrisome to me well one of the way that microsoft got out of it or got out of their funk uh aside from changing management stuff was they tried a lot of different things most of which failed but they they tried a lot of them and i think you know if i look at like what was what was the success story that uh was able to convince microsoft itself and the outside world that microsoft could conceivably do good things again i feel like it was the xbox because that was a weird market like why the hell is yeah. microsoft making a game console right and it you know it struggled and they had to learn this new business in the same way that apple kind of had to learn the new business of cell phones and they didn't it you know it is not comparable to the, the iphone obviously in terms of the the scope of its success and how important it was to you know because it was just another game console for the most part although it had its own innovations but it of all the things they did, they tried so many things, so many different mobile phone strategies, so many different tablet and pen computing. Like they were so close to so many innovations, but because they kept trying all these different things, uh, you know, I, I don't even remember half the things they did. That, that sidekick company that they bought with a little dirty smartphone <laughs> thing that they sold, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Xbox, of all things, like unquestionably was a success in its market in a very difficult market that has killed many a company who have tried to enter it and be successful. Um, and so it, I, I think Apple probably continues to need to, uh, need, needs to continue to do what it seems to have been doing and like be willing to try Like the watch is a good example. Try a watch. Maybe it's going to be awesome. Maybe you won't or whatever, but, but do it. Like we don't need to be, I don't think we need to be convinced that Apple can still do great things because you know, the, the, the Apple watch is as successful as it may or may not be. It's you know i think it's a big step up for the the smartwatch market and in many ways has has come to not redefine that market but sort of pin down what people expect from smartwatches to the point where smartwatches uh are very much now uh aping some of the looks and features of apple's things if only to uh to capitalize on their uh you know their marketing cachet uh but self-driving cars all sorts of things that we say why is apple even doing that all you need is one or two of them to hit for it to be worthwhile. 
thus far, none of them have been big successes. Uh, but if Apple was in a Microsoft type situation, we would all be looking at the watch or the AirPods and say, see, Apple can make great things again. Apple's not down that low. When we see the AirPods, we're like, yes, that's what Apple should be doing. And that's what we expect of you, right? Versus we are super surprised that you've made a successful, good product. We're not surprised. It's what we expect. We still expect, we still have high expectations of Apple. We still have, we still hold them to high standards. And I think that's good. Um, but I also like, that's why I don't want to be too down on all the weird stuff Apple is doing. And I know it's easy to do the, you know, the trade-offs like, oh, you should just be making Macs better because that's what I like or whatever. But as you pointed out, Marco, for all we know, those are entirely separate things and it's not like they lack the money. So as long as it's not literally the people who are going to make the Mac Pro who are now making self-driving car software, like go for it. Well, more power to you. Um, eventually we may be the point where we're looking for Apple's Xbox uh and maybe i was gonna say maybe apple should just make a gaming console but they're really terrible at gaming so don't do that uh once they buy nintendo (laughs) and the the show finally comes to an end because the apocalypse that will happen (laughs) if that comes to pass um yeah i i i'm not i'm not as down on on apple as you are marco i continue to believe that they can come out of it and i think microsoft is a great example that no matter how low you go there's always something great you can do and i I would hold up azure as an example of that too and a lot of the the dev tool stuff that microsoft has been doing they had a lot of smart people that had a lot of great tech it was just a matter of finding a way to channel that into productive in a productive way while also continuing to milk the cash cow that is their terrible enterprise software (laughs) no i mean like my my main concern here is that, you know, as I said, 2016 was a really bad year for Apple, uh, f- like from the public point of view. And Tim can say stuff like, oh, we have stuff coming. Don't worry. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean we're not working on it. But like, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. Um, and and it, just, it just seems like there's these areas of, of Apple product development that have stalled or that have taken way too long. Um, and there seems to be not only no end in sight, but no changes that would suggest that there would be you know, a, a change of policy or change of results coming. And so what I want is by the end of 2017, I think there's a, there's a handful of like big hotspot areas that if they are still lacking, I want to see somebody get fired. I know it's not cool to talk about Apple executives and SVPs and talk about them personally and say who should get fired. But I think things are bad enough now that heads have to roll if certain things don't get fixed. And I would say maybe the list would be, you know, Mac desktops, hardware, you know, iPhone design. Like if that new iPhone does not come out this fall and they have another year of the iPhone 6 design and, you know, general form factor, that's a problem, right? If Mac desktops do not get any kind of meaningful update th- during this year, that's a big problem. I would say iPad software. Uh, like multitasking on the iPad is one of these areas where like that needs to be improved significantly in some way. Um, I would say Siri, the quality of Siri, the reliability, the, the intelligence of Siri needs to be improved. And uh, maybe I'd throw in TV content deals, as we talked about earlier, because those have also been stalled forever and the Apple TV is suffering greatly. Um, so those things, like if all of those don't have meaningful improvements by the end of 2017, then that will be a very long time during which these things have not improved and desperately need to. And somebody high up needs to get fired or resign at that point. Well, well, you would like that to happen. But if uh, (laughs) the rest of the world says, hey, record iPhone sales, here's a 10% bump to your stock price, Apple. Apple is doing great from the perspective of investors and and other people who have, uh, you know, the broader world that has expectations of what Apple is supposed to do, which is sell a lot of iPhones for a high price. They're doing that really, really well so far. And everything we're talking about is tiny little slivers of the of the giant pie wedge that is the, the revenue of Apple. Well, no, it's not because look, Microsoft did really well under Steve Ballmer it financially for a long time. He had like record quarters, record sales as the product line just stagnated and crumbled and the quality the foundation the company was built on crumbled and the world around it moved on to this massive new world of mobile and they totally missed it because they were not being managed properly. So this is it's not it, the fact that they keep selling record quarters is not good enough for Apple. But, but, but what I'm saying is like a, a, executives don't get fired when your stock price goes up in general. All right. So I'm saying I'm saying like whether you think it's the right thing to do or, or what you would do versus what is actually going to happen. Right. Because the only thing we've seen executives get canned for at Apple is not getting along with other executives. That's forced all um, 
not being like a cultural fit or like flailing and not being a success like whatever paper master and those people who were there for a very short time right what would it take for a long timer to get fired i mean i think we've seen with the reshuffling not firing but like i don't, we don't know what's going on with that reshuffling that they've done various times but surely that reshuffling is elevating some people and 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 minimizing other people right within the company enough so that they all stay there but still like still still affecting them right you're not going to see like a, a big name executive get fired when every kind of metric you can put on the company is looking good because that's just not how big companies work now arguably like you said they're making a big mistake that sure you're figuring out how to make more money out of the iphone but what about the future of blah 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 but they have answers for all that well future we have all these super projects that you don't know about plus the car crap and stuff like that and maybe they'll hit and maybe they won't like it's not not like they had their heads in the sand right but i don't what i'm saying is that don't get your hopes up for that to happen right even if even if none of the things you listed happen but they still have like record iphone sales again and the asp goes up again no no one's getting fired like i mean if that if whoever was responsible for getting a skinny bundle tv deal hasn't been fired yet another year of not getting it is not going to make a difference to give an example that's relevant to the things we just talked about because obviously it's not important enough to the future of the company um and in other areas like the phone like not the phone the watch it's hard to tell exactly how the watch is doing because Apple's being cagey about it, but I feel like the watch is on a slow burn, right? It is, it's not a super duper success like the iPhone was, but even the iPhone wasn't a super duper success in its first year or two, right? Or the iPod or anything like that. But Apple is standing behind the watch and working on it, and things seem like they're going in the right direction with the watch. It is getting better. People like it more. It is finding a place in the market. Yeah, I actually would agree with that. The watch, there is a reason why the watch didn't make my hit list because, like, it actually it is not amazing. You know, it, it, on all terms, it has lots of asterisks on it, but overall, it is healthy, and it it does seem to be on the right track. And so, like the Apple that is still willing to nurture a product like that, that you know, even the iPad, which arguably they're nurturing and 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 helping along, and you know, they're trying to get it. You know, come on, come on, little product, like you can do it. Maybe they're not quite <laughs> doing the right things, but like the fact that they're standing behind those and the, and all the rumblings we hear about AR and stuff like that, I do see a lot of encouraging things of like how is apple fostering the you know the development of what could be eventually big important businesses and how patient they're being with it most of our frustration is with pre-existing businesses that seem like they are neglected right and because we like those products but i i I am. I don't know enough about the executives to say someone should be fired i think if, if i had to restructure slash restaff a bunch of things you know what i would my picks is all server side uh stuff like that's that part of the company is obviously in the most need and i don't know who's in charge of that and i don't know who needs to be in charge of it but like apple should have bought google long ago and given all the responsibility to all their server side stuff for google because they know what the hell they're doing and apple does not yet they're getting better but not fast enough um what's getting better faster apple at services or desktop linux uh apple at services because that's yep, linux is going definitely. nowhere <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah but but i can't i can't pin that to a particular group or executive and i think there has been restructuring this seeing apple like presented like mesos conferences and stuff is showing that that is actually going in the right direction they're just so far behind that it's very difficult to catch up but for all the other things like even the mac things i don't i don't feel like the people who are involved in mac hardware like I don't. I don't know. I don't know where the, the blame lies for that. It seems like priorities that would set, be set above the level of the people working on the Mac stuff, right? Like, I bet everyone who's working on the Mac loves the Mac and wants it to be awesome. And I bet a lot of people who are involved in the Mac love the Mac and want it to be awesome. But it's clear that the the pace of product releases and innovation and choices about the particular mixes of the products are not satisfying a certain class of Mac users, and, and we find that unsatisfying. And even for the people it is satisfying, I feel like the releases are slower, which, you know, is not, you know, it's not good from anybody's perspective that like, we want to see new, better things faster. Um, but I wouldn't fire anyone involved in the Mac organization, right? I, I feel like that's a priority set at, at a higher level. Um, and I wouldn't fire Tim Cook because of all the good things that we just listed, the phone and the watch and, and trying to figure out how to make the iPad better. Um, yeah, I'm, I I I have to have hopes for this year, and I found last year disappointing. But um, 
I, I think I'm I think I'm more optimistic than you are that these are all eminently fixable problems, and I am encouraged by by uh, efforts like the watch. Yeah, and furthermore, I I don't entirely get what firing somebody really accomplishes, other than making you feel better that that somebody's paying for what you don't like, and it it, it certainly would presumably change course of Apple at least slightly if that executive was high enough, but. I mean, we we don't know what's going on behind the curtain. We don't know if they're playing a long game that 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 will revolutionize the Mac or revolutionize something else or just create a whole new thing that we can't even fathom. We don't know what the long what what they're doing behind closed doors. And I, I just feel like seeing a head roll or demanding a head roll. I, I don't know that that's necessarily going to really change anything. I mean, you, just because one or even a couple people leave or are told to leave. You don't move a ship that big without moving the rudder a lot. And one person can only move the rudder but so much, unless they're like Steve Jobs or Tim Cook. I think the reason why I want to see something change, if all these things still continue to fail at the end of this year, is that no, if no heads roll, if no one changes jobs, if, if nothing really suggests that anything went wrong, then that is Apple tacitly telling the world and possibly themselves internally, this is fine. This is how we wanted things to go. It's one thing if the reason why all these things are in neglect right now is because lots of things have gone wrong, or somebody really messed up, or somebody made a terrible decision, or took a bad risk, or something like that. It's another thing if these things are all this way in this state of neglect because that's considered okay. So if something if, if there's somebody who like whose job changes, for instance, the role of the App Store recently got taken out of its previous organization and moved under Phil Schiller. And in the like eight years or whatever it was that it was under the previous organization, nothing happened. <laughs> like it was just stagnant and had lots of problems. And it's been under Schiller for about a year now, and lots of improvements have happened already. And there's you know, they're they're at a great pace. So obviously that was an area where Something was really not working right. It was had a lot of problems. It got moved to a different executive. So effectively, the old executive was like, you know, presumably like removed from it in some kind of action, you know, or some kind of decision. And then under the new executive, things change because something wasn't going right. So that was a recognition internally to the company that this this is not working. This is not good enough. We're going to change it so it can be good enough. And so if nothing changes in this list of things that, that you know Mac desktops, iPhone yes, if nothing changes and we and these things are still being neglected almost a year from now, after being neglected for the last few years, then that to me is a sign that Tim Cook and everyone beneath him believes that is good enough. So that ultimately rests on Tim. Whether the problem is Tim himself or somebody below him, that is on Tim to manage, to supervise, and to fix if there are problems. You know, when, when there are problems between Forstall and Ive and whoever, whatever the drama was there, Tim saw there was a problem here, and he fixed it. And whether you like his solution or not, he took an action because things were not good enough. He fixed it. If nothing changes in these areas and they're still being horribly neglected in another year from now, then that is Tim Cook implicitly saying, this is good enough. Yeah, but, but that, that's a strategic choice, though. If he, if he chooses to de-emphasize the Mac or cancel the Mac entirely, that is a strategic choice for the company that will make all of us yep. sad. But yep. like, it's not, it's not saying like we think this is good enough. It's saying, yeah, we're deprioritizing that and shifting our efforts elsewhere because we don't think that's an important important to the future growth of the company, right? Which we hate and we we don't like, but... Like, it's not as the same as saying we're trying to put everything we have behind the Mac. Like, it's the difference in intention. Like, we are trying to make the Mac the best it could possibly be, and this is our best effort. I'm not even asking for that. I'm asking for basic maintenance. Yeah, well, again, because if, they're, if they were trying to say we are trying to maintain the Mac in the fashion that it has been maintained in the past, and they think this is satisfactory, you're right that they're, that they're wrong on that. But... If instead they're saying this is exactly the amount of support for the Mac that we want, this is exactly how we want it to go, these are exactly the products we want out of them, we're very happy with the results, this is our strategic direction, we're all sad and mad about it, but from a company 
you know, from the perspective of is Tim Cook making the right decision for the company, it's arguable that he is because the Mac is clearly not the future of Apple, right? It's just this thing that we all like and use, right? And if it means that more time and energy and money is available for whatever you know the actual future future Apple is going to be, but it's going to be the watch or AR or self driving car software or who knows what. That is probably the correct strategic direction for the company, despite how angry it makes us. I think it is entirely a question of of uh, of what their intent is, because it's like judging whether it's a success or a failure. Um, we see what the results are. And if that is the intended results, then they're getting exactly what they want. And then our quibble is just with the strategic direction. Whereas if the intended result is very different than what we're actually getting, then that's the company failing to, you know, execute successfully on its own plan, right? And because Apple doesn't really tell you what its own plans are in terms of how it emphasizes product lines and stuff, other than the sort of the PR pablum that we get about, uh, you know, we love the Mac, blah, 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 which really says nothing. Um, it's very difficult to judge whether they are failing or successfully executing a strategy we don't like. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and I concur that I am disappointed with the way the Mac has been treated. And I would like to see it be different. But just because my engine isn't revved by a touch bar doesn't mean the touch bar is wrong. It doesn't mean that it was a failure. It doesn't mean that Apple isn't innovating. It doesn't mean it's not a magical, awesome improvement. All it means is it's not right for me. And for me to to hypothetically say, oh, that Apple's doing everything wrong or that you know the, the head of Mac hardware should be fired strictly because of the touch bar, which is not what you're saying, Marco. That's not at all what I'm saying. Nope. That's no, not I know what I'm it's not. I know it's not. But I, I think in a, what I'm trying – let me just rephrase and say that I think – you're conflating a disappointment with direction. This is what John was just alluding to a difference in direction or, or, or disappointment in direction with a failure. And that is not necessarily the case. Just like John said, I agree that I, I, I don't like the way things are going, but I think it's too strong to say that it's a failure at this point. It's just, it seems a little bit aggressive to me. No, and I didn't say these things are all failures at this point. I said that these are, you know, these are like, you know, checks the 2016 wrote for 2017 to cash. And if 2017 goes through and these things are all still a problem, something needs to change big time. Because it isn't, you know, I'm not saying that a company that's trying to maximize its revenue and make itself a, a solid growth potential in the future shouldn't change strategy. What I am saying is that Apple does not ship sh- Apple's entire brand and the reputation they've built up over years and years and years is that they don't ship shit. That Apple products are good. They are great. And for them to keep saying that and to have major areas of the product line that are really embarrassing or really like customer hostile even uh, for years on end that they keep selling just to scrape a little bit more profit off the pavement before they just totally kill them. That is not what Apple should be doing. That is like just for Apple, like for corporation X. Sure. Let, let Steve Ballmer run it. Then why isn't Steve Ballmer running it? That's what they want to do. If that's the goal. Let him do it. He's great at that, but that's not Apple. That's not good enough for Apple. It never has been. And it shouldn't be now. Yeah. I mean, I, I, in the grand scheme of things, even though I'm, actively arguing with you right now i do largely agree with you i think that you're right that 2016 wrote a lot of checks that i've yet to see 2017 cash um i I just uh, what concerns me is i i I wonder if you're putting apple on a pedestal and if they don't release the most perfect mac pro ever that that you're going to still be fiery about it if if they don't you know version bump the macbook MacBook adorable you're going to be fiery about it truth be told i will be too but don't tell marco Uh, the macbook adorable is only one year old that's fine by 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 my standards that's totally fine (laughs) yeah and i mean also remember we're only one calendar quarter into the year yet i mean there's still plenty of time left now in your defense marco typically there is a march event of some sort and we are already halfway through march and there's been not even a a a peep of a confirmation about it which means they'll surely confirm it tomorrow before we release the episode but nevertheless um you know we haven't heard a march event yet and that's slightly alarming but it's only march we don't know what's in store for the rest of the year and who knows our our socks could be blown off at wwdc and typically they're at least, you know, my, my socks are at least uh, blown a little bit forward, if not entirely off my feet to beat this <laughs> analogy to death. And so you never know what will happen. But I, I, I don't I wouldn't 
I, I think we shouldn't get too fiery yet. If after WWDC and we've seen the software updates and we still haven't seen much in the way of hardware updates, okay, maybe we should start getting fiery. But at this point, I'm not too concerned yet. Yeah, but to the, on the topic of figuring out, like fi- trying to figure out intent, like basically, is is it a is it a uh, a successful execution of a strategy we disagree with, or a failed execution of a strategy that we would support? That type of thing. The Mac Pro is actually a good example because uh, on the uh, the idea of Apple not shipping things that they would be proud of, right? The Mac Pro, I think, is the best example of it. It's not that it was, it, it was a bad product when it was introduced. It's actually really cool and interesting. It's that if you keep shipping it for three years, it becomes an embarrassment, right? It, and it is the type of embarrassment that, like, look, there is no strategy that makes sense with the image that Apple previously had. Unless the new idea is we don't want Apple to have that reputation, which doesn't make any sense because everything else Apple does and everything they say and everything they've always done is like, yes, we want to be the company that has a reputation of shipping good stuff. The Mac Pro is... Um, it's you they shouldn't still be selling it and i understand why they're why if you were to, if you were to get someone up on stage and talk to them in a wdc you know talk show type interview and say why are you still shipping the mac pro i guarantee you what they will say and it's probably true is you know we didn't want we we you know some vague answer about how they had it they didn't plan for this like there was a strategy to do to do something better and it didn't work out so i would say they would they would they would vaguely admit to some kind of failure there and they would say well then why are you even still selling it they would say well because we have customers who need a computer like this and actually believe it or not and casey could probably believe it not selling this <laughs> now piece of crap overpriced computer would actually be worse for those customers than continuing to sell it and then the only recourse you have for that is like, okay, but do you still have to sell it for like eight grand? And they'd be like, well, people buy it. And that, you know, whatever. Apple has never been ashamed of selling people things for way too much money. But that's the situation they're in. So I feel like the Mac Pro, to figure out, is this a strategy we don't agree with or is this a failure? There has to be a failure in there. They're not going to come and tell you exactly what the failures are. You know what I mean? Like, they're not going to say, oh, here's what went wrong or whatever. But that seems very clear to me. There is no conscious strategy that Apple says, you know what, we're going to make pro hardware and then we're not going to update it for three or four years. There, I, I do not believe that was ever Apple's strategy. That is evidence of a failure. How big a failure is that in the grand scheme of things? I don't know or whatever. But that is the only thing that it seemed clear from the outset. Everything else you can say, is it a failure to like ship make all your laptops thin and lighter is that a strategy or is it a failure to have computers that aren't really that much better than the ones they replace but are more expensive or is that part of a strategy like a lot almost everything else i look at and i squint and say that seems a lot like a strategy maybe a strategy i don't agree with personally from my tastes and products or whatever but it seems like a strategy but the mac pro does not seem like a strategy it seems like a failure um counter argument the mac mini uh, Mac Mini is totally fine. They could update it. It's really easily updated. It uses cheap component parts. That's definitely that's a strategy. R- well, and so their strategy was, let's put this thing out there, but because it doesn't sell in very high volumes, let's never update it, basically. Why couldn't that have been the same strategy for the Mac Pro? No, because the Mac Pro, the whole point of the Mac Pro it is, is the biggest, fastest computer for the most demanding workloads. And the rest of Apple's product line, like the 5K Mac, has passed it by. Like, its role in the product line is to be the biggest, fastest, and most expensive. The role of the Mac Mini is to be the cheapest and crappiest. Success. Like, you know, if you, just, <laughs> if you never update it, it exactly fills its role of the cheapest and crappiest. And you're just like, oh, this is a product Apple doesn't care about and doesn't really care about updating. That, I feel like, Mac Mini looks totally like strategy to me. But there is no world in which a strategy of, like, we're going to make the biggest, fastest computer and then never make it any faster. And the whole rest of our product line, including eventually our watches, are going to be faster than this freaking trash can. That's, that's not a strategy because of the slot that the product goes in. So it's got to be a failure. Hmm. I, I I don't I don't think we have a, enough Tim Cook Apple history to know that I I think that is very plausibly I I think it was probably a failure of some kind but I think it's very plausibly also just a strategy of how today's Apple deals with low volume products. We we need to like write all these things down so that we can wait like in twenty years for like the tell all book like we need to track down these long retired millionaire Apple executives like. What the hell happened with the Mac Pro? Like, tell us. Because from the outside, we can't tell. What, you know, was it just like an Intel thing that you didn't get or the sales volume or there was something like, I don't know, what what was the, what happened? Like, or did you have it designed and there were fatal flaws with this little triangle design and you're just eating the cost on these GPU replacements and the new one you had planned didn't work? Like, what what happened? Whereas the Mac Mini, I feel like you interviewed them, you're like, yeah, no one cares about that computer. It's low end. <laughs> <laughs> and it compiles faster than the Mac Pro anyway. Wow. 
Oh, is there any show that we can't eventually get to the Mac Pro about? Casey loves it. <laughs> That's the best. It makes me so happy. Thanks to our three sponsors this week, Eero, Betterment, and Squarespace. And we will see you next week. Now the show is over. They didn't even mean to begin. Because it was accidental. accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental. John didn't do any research. Marco and Casey wouldn't let him. Because it was accidental. accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental. And you can find the show notes at atp.fm. And if you're into Twitter, you can follow them at C A S E Y L. ISS, so that's Casey Liss, M A R C O A R M E N T, Marco Arment, S I R A C U S A Syracuse. It's accidental. Can we please talk about something that'll make us happier? Please. Like the Switch, maybe, hopefully, possibly. John, how do you like your Switch? Uh, it's hard to say how I like my Switch because... Oh, come on, far- man. <laughs> this is supposed to be your happy place. No, no, no. Because as far as, like, I feel kind of bad because a lot of people who I know who are using the Switch are all talking about it and they're talking about the hardware and it's like... This is just a Zelda delivery device for me at this point. <laughs> kind of like... It, it, you know, my PlayStation 4 became my Destiny delivery device. Uh, and in that capacity, I wish, as always, that the hardware was faster because then I wouldn't have uh, slowdowns in forested areas. Uh, and it's like, I, I still find myself thinking, can you imagine how, how uh, you know, how even better this game would be on the PS4? But in general, um, I don't spend much time dwelling on that because I'm really, really loving Zelda. I think it's a great game. I enjoy it. I think about it when I'm not playing it. I can't wait to play it every time I'm away from the game. Uh, and it's like watching a movie. I really don't think about the quality of my Blu-ray player when I'm watching a good movie. I think about the movie. So when I'm playing Zelda, I'm thinking about Zelda. And it's awesome. And it's great. And my Switch has n- literally never been held in my hands to play a game. And it has not left the dock since I got Zelda. So really? that's how I'm using my Switch. It is. I'm pretending that Nintendo is still releasing TV connected consoles and not this hybrid portable thing. And I'm perfectly happy with that. Eventually, I probably will take it out and try playing it handheld and see what that's like. But for now, it is me, a pro controller, uh, and Zelda, and I'm loving it. No spoilers, please. You know, it's funny. So I played with um, two different people's switches. My sister-in-law got one and she came over the evening of um, of launch day. And then the following day, I went to my friend Steve's house and, and played with his for a little bit. And in, I guess in a kind of opposite way in that uh, I don't think I really want a uh, canister to speak to because I don't really see how it will help my life. I want to switch so badly, even though I know I'll play it for like a week and then never look back because I just think this thing is so darn cool. And I've been super impressed by it. Uh, we actually hooked it up to my TV because my sister, in uh, my sister in laws that is because she hadn't hooked it up to hers yet. And I thought that was super awesome. I played a few minutes of Zelda. I thought that was really cool. I didn't play it enough to like really get into it, but my initial impressions were great. Um, the hardware with the, with the weirdly named joy cons, like I find that name to be a little bit peculiar, but the, 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 the click that it makes when you plug, when you slide one of them in and removing it is so cool. And the kickstand is a little chintzy or whatever, but it still gets the job done for the most part. Like everything about this hardware is so cool. And I really want one for no reason at all, because I, I'm just not really a video game kind of guy. Um, but man, this thing is neat, and I'm super impressed by it. And it's the first time I've lusted uh, after a video game system since the original Wii, which I did play a lot of for about a year, and then I just never looked back. Um, but I've been super, super uh, anxious to get my hands on one, even though... Well, I mean, I could get my hands on one, I'm sure. But I, I know myself enough to know that I'm just... I'm I'm in lust, I'm not in love. But... We'll see what happens over time. Marco, you you guys are, I guess, really Tiff got one, right? So, what have you thought? Uh, we haven't we haven't really played it much. Um, I 
So I, I I just came back from a trip. I I left that trip shortly after last. Or I left for that trip shortly after last week's show. The night before the trip, I tried to buy and download Zelda, and the the credit card thing on Nintendo's website just kept failing and timing out, and everything like their whole website just sucked that night. It just like everything kept failing, and so I wasn't able to buy it in time for the trip, and so I didn't bring it because I'm like you know I, I have like you know I have Bomberman and that racing game. Neither of which I've actually played yet. I just because like it, you know buying and installing this stuff, it all takes time, and then I have to do something else. And then I left for a trip, and I'm like, well, I'm not going to bring this entire console, taking up space in my bag, and one more thing to charge, and everything else, just for these two kind of like you know second tier games. I you know if I could get Zelda before the show, sure I'll bring it, but I couldn't. So that's so I didn't bring it, and uh, now we're back, and I'm dealing with all the work I missed. So I still haven't actually played it yet, um, and I'd love to play it on my TV. But I can't get a pro controller anywhere, so that kind of breaks that as well. I don't really want to use the weird no, little like you can still oh you can still play it. I was gonna say you can play it on your TV without a pro controller. You just got to use the Joy Cons. So that, that a lot of people have asked me if I have like the left Joy Con disconnecting thing. I don't know. I don't use those things. <laughs> use the pro right. controller, and it works fine. Right, exactly. So, so it like, does not disconnect. Yeah. So so I need to get myself a pro controller uh, to to really enjoy this thing because what I really want is to just it's most of the time to play these games on my TV. Uh, so once I get that, then let me know. But I'm also, um, I suspect that these initial games I got are probably not going to be a lot of my time. I'm not really into Zelda. Tiff would probably play it, but I, I probably won't. Uh, I'm more into like the racing and stuff games. So when Mario Kart comes out, I'm very much into that. Uh, but I, that's not out yet. (laughs) And like when the new Sonic thing comes out, I'll be very much into that probably, but that also isn't out yet. Uh, Mario games, when those come out, but they also aren't <laughs> the, any kind of virtual console stuff to uh, to maybe play some of the games that I've missed since like the Super Nintendo era or the N sixty four era, like to play some of the, some of like the the Mario games that have come out in the middle. If if that becomes available and possible to do, I'd love to do that, but I can't yet because they don't exist. So eventually, I expect to really enjoy this thing, but right now I've barely used it because everything I've tried to do either failed or took too long, and then I had to go on a trip. I feel like there are like three obvious possibilities with with this Zelda, this Zelda in particular. One is you're a super Zelda fan and you played all the the 3D Zelda games and you love them. You will also love this game. So that that's the easy case. That's why all the gaming press loves it. That's why I love it, right? Two is you don't know a Zelda from a hole in the wall, um, and <laughs> you bought the Switch because you saw one and thought it was neat, and you get Zelda because it's like the you know the the popular top tier game to get on launch, and you start playing it, and you just slowly gradually get lost in zelda playing your version of what you think the zelda game is supposed to be about maybe not even advancing the actual main quest storyline for a very long time and spend like literally a year and a half consumed by this little toy box world because you have never played a sandbox game before and you've never played a zelda and this is all entirely new to you right and the third possibility is you've never played a zelda you get this game you try it and you're like this seems big and confusing, not for me. And I think that's what Marco's going to happen. It's like, yeah, mm. I, it's neat. I can see how people might like it, but not my type of game. And probably also happened to Tiff because it's it's very difficult, I feel like, to play this Zelda game in particular and any Zelda game in a casual way. You're either going to know what you're getting into and know you like this kind of game or not know what you're getting into and just be completely consumed because you don't have the antibodies for this type of thing, but you are the type of person who is entirely, who does like this kind of game. And for that type of person, like I can imagine sticking literally hundreds of hours into this non-multiplayer, single-player, completely entirely scripted, deterministic game because you'll just be like climbing trees and picking apples and cooking food and, and exploring and occasionally advancing this big overarching world story thing, which may eventually get too hard for you to do anyway. And like, cause if you've never done that before, this is amazing. I've done all this stuff before and I'm like, you know, amazed and excited and just want to go exploring and do things and like constantly getting distracted from advancing the main quest by all of the other things that you can do, whether they be official side quests or entirely different ones. And it's just, it's, for for an experienced Zelda, it express it, it impresses experienced Zelda fans, but I think like the best like the ideal experience is for like for this to be your first Zelda and for you to be the type of person who loves Zelda but you don't know it yet because you've never played one. This was your first Zelda game. Like some ki- for some kid, this is going to be this kid's first Zelda game. It's going to blow their mind. They're going to talk about this game like we talk about Mario sixty four of being like, oh, so that's what three D platforming is. Oh, I see. That's that's how three D works. Like. 
like completely, you know, uh, childhood defining game type experience. Um, so I'm, I'm excited by this, but I have dim hopes that Marco will get anything out of it. And I'm not sure about Tiff because she's been hot and cold on the, on the other 3d Zelda games. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, I'm as with, as with so many other game consoles that I buy, if this was the only game I was ever allowed to play on the switch already worth the money. Hmm. See, for me, I, I expect Mario Kart will probably be that game. Uh, if not one of the later Mario's, but yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I've wondered when the Mario Kart comes out because I haven't played Mario Kart in a long time, and and my understanding is it's just like a, a slight refresh or something like that. But either way, um, when it comes out, if I give that a shot, that might give me enough ammunition to buy the Switch. Be- and the reason I say that is not because I don't think I would love Zelda. I think I would, but I view that as I would play it once and then be done. And I don't know if it's worth what three hundred dollars for the Switch and like seventy dollars, sixty dollars for the Zelda. So call it four hundred dollars. You would play it once as in in one sitting, or you think you would finish the whole game? No, no, no. I'm saying over the course of like a month or two, maybe I would finish the whole game. But I don't know if I want to spend four hundred dollars on Zelda because it, I I feel like I would play Zelda. Think, wow, that was really great. I'm glad I did that and then never look at the switch again but if i see like mario kart which i know that i've loved pre- previous mario kart games if i see that and it's you know well reviewed and i get to play it on you know one of my friends uh, uh consoles and, and i like it that might change things additionally i've never played splatoon but i've heard nothing but universal praise for it so i, I believe that's again like a refresh or a new version is coming for the switch at some point so maybe if i play that i'll think oh you know maybe this is worth it um but sitting here now i i, I am i'm looking for a reason to spend my money on this thing and i just can't come up with it yet if you're gonna play that many games though and you're like you're rattling off all those things that you think you might play like honestly it'd be better for you to get a ps4 because there are there are so many different choices in franchise like the, the next game in my queue for example is uh, horizon zero dawn which has a terrible title um which is also an open world type game but looks 100 times better because it's on ps4 and you know anyway uh it's being compared to zelda a lot uh but on a PS4, you get that, you get the Uncharted series, you get all the all the top tier games. On Nintendo's thing, you just get Nintendo's top tier games. So it is, it is slimmer pickings, and I, I feel like you would have a better experience on a on a quote unquote real TV connected uh, console. But for for Nintendo specific franchises, Mario Kart Eight, I I feel like I know what that's going to be because I already played it. This is a deluxe version, right? Um, and for me. I still miss the driving mechanics of Double Dash. It's still my favorite. But Mario Kart 8 was a really good Mario Kart. And just adding more tracks and everything is also going to make it really good. But I find, as I get older, my tolerance for rubber banding AI in racing games is decreasing mightily. <laughs> and and because I was never particularly good at racing games, multiplayer is just another, another avenue for me to feel frustrated because everyone I play online is 100 times better than I am. So it's almost almost becomes like a party game where like it's only good when you're playing with other people and even then even within my own family it's hard to find people of our skill ranges are too too widely varied right that's the problem (laughs) and so we we could play four player mario kart but two to three people are going to be really upset (laughs) because they're never going to (laughs) win and and that's bad um but yeah like i I'm, i'm not entirely sure that you should get a switch casey uh I think probably eventually Declan will tell you what you should get and you should just do what he says. That's my, <laughs> yeah, not yet, but eventually he'll tell you which console you should get and why, and you should just listen to him and do that. And then maybe you can, maybe he can show you the ropes and, uh, teach you some things. Well, there's a couple things you're not considering, though. Like, number one, I classically was a Nintendo kind of guy. Um, I had everything up through and including the 64, and then what was it, GameCube, and then I did not have. Then I had a Wii, and I didn't do anything since the you Wii. I believe you skipped the GameCube, man. So many good games. Such a good controller. <laughs> to be fair, a lot of people skipped the GameCube. <laughs> Also true. It was less about the hardware, more about me just not really being interested in games anymore. And and that's the other thing is that, you know, you're probably right on paper that a PS4 would be a better, like a a more worthwhile purchase. But all of these top tier games that that any normal human or any normal gamer would would want to play, I just don't really have much interest in. Like, I know that I I have played at least one Zelda game. I played all of Ocarina of Time and, and a fair bit of what I th- whatever was on the Wii, if memory serves. Um, Skyward Sword? Where you wave the controller around to wave the sword? No, maybe it wasn't the Wii then. That's I don't what remember. I'm saying. I don't think it was the Wii. 
Um, it, I don't remember what it was. Maybe it was one for the GameCube, but I played it on the Wii. It doesn't Twilight, really matter. Twilight Princess. Wind yes, Waker. I think that's. I think it was Twilight Princess. Now that you say that, it doesn't really matter though. The point is that I, the couple that I've played, I've enjoyed. But other than that, uh, what appeals to me about the Switch is that I think it would be great for the party games that I remember from when I was a kid from the Nintendo 64, like the equivalents thereof. So like Mario Kart, things like GoldenEye, which I see Splatoon kind of filling that void. You know what I mean? It's, it's, I, I don't have a terrible interest in going online and playing strangers because I know I'll get just completely destroyed by eight year olds and that's okay. Um, but having a bunch of friends or family or both over and playing sounds really appealing. And I was super impressed like god knows if this would work at all or if it would work well but i was super impressed uh by the like trailer promo video or whatever that came out in october where they had like a a portable switch and that's redundant but you know a a switch not docked and they had like two people playing each with their own joy con or i think there might have even been one where they had like four people playing or or at certainly at another point they had like a series of switches Switch eye, whatever the plural is that in yeah. this particular switch context. eye is correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. That's definitely it. The plural of switch is switch, you guys. But anyway, um, they had they had uh, you know several switches all in like a circle, and presumably they were all like networked together. Um, there was another case where there's like I think a basketball game where they were back to back, um, and and they were and there were a bunch of people playing simultaneously. Like the, the, I have no interest in a basketball game. I don't remember what the 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 group was playing. It might have been Splatoon. But that sort of a thing is what makes the Switch most interested, interesting to me. And that portability, the fact that it can switch, ding, between being docked and undocked, uh, that to me is what I find so interesting about it. Maybe that's silly. Maybe that's stupid. But, I mean, that's why emotions are not logic and logic is not emotional. Uh, I just It's the way I feel. I just think that that's what's really neat and interesting about it. A lot of people are enjoying playing, portable playing, like within their own house, like playing in bed. <laughs> oh, so yeah yeah seriously no like, i i think that would apply to me absolutely and i've done it i've done it with the way you when i was playing mario kart 8 for instance and the family wanted to watch the tv i could continue to play mario kart 8 just on the the wii u uh gamepad um and i came to actually like it that way it's, it's the same thing that got me with the gaming monitor like being closer to the screen being able to see more detail um i haven't done the math and the angles on it but i think it just you can get it to fill more of your field of view even though i have the 55 inch television i do sit kind of far away from it and i even felt like i know this can't possibly be true maybe it is i don't know i even felt like the input lag was reduced even though the video was being wirelessly sent to this handheld thing like the game was actually playing on the wii u that's attached to my tv and it was wirelessly sending the video like surely that has more lag than playing it on my actual tv but for whatever reason Bottom line is I did better. I did I did better against the accursed rubber banding AI in Mario Kart 8 and in getting five stars or three stars or whatever it is, max rating and all these things to unlock all the stuff. I did better when I had it in my hand. And I and I found that fun, being able to be in the same room as other people, but not occupying the giant TV while, you know, they watch some show and I play this thing. Have again, I haven't done that with the Switch yet. I've been doing entirely on TV, mostly because my son and I are playing the new Zelda together. And anyone else who happens to come in the room wants to see what we're up to because we're up to some awesome stuff. Um, and But then it's, it's easier for us to sit in front of a TV and Zelda is not a Twitch game where you have to have like amazing response times and amazing frame rate. And it's a good thing because you don't have that. But uh, it's, it's more fun for everyone to like look and to be looking at the big screen and admiring the scenery and pointing out the sparkles that I don't see out of the corner of my eye, which means that I have to go pick up an arrow that I shot 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a blast. It's awesome. <laughs> well, if you uh, ever get bored of yours, just uh, send it my way. Uh, I'll I'll no. play the snot out of uh, it. But I can't take it out of the dock because I might scratch the screen. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> you guys are you guys aware of this controversy? This internet no. controversy. So uh, people, do you know you know that the switch goes into like the little napkin holder thingy that's yeah, the dock? Yeah, yeah mine's right? in there now. Should, should I be afraid of taking it out? Somehow, somewhere, people are getting scratches on like the sides of the screen not the part that lights up but still kind of like the screen surface like the black area mm-hmm. around it and all sorts of internet photos and they're like scratches on it and they're like is that 
Is it happening because you're sliding and in and out of the plastic dock and like, oh, the plastic dock is scratching people's switches. You need to get a screen protector. But then people get screen protectors and the heat from the switch makes the screen protectors peel off and buckle. And they're saying, oh, you shouldn't oh, get nice. screen protectors. And then someone puts a video of them taking their switch and slamming it in and out and in and out and into the dock as hard as they possibly can, like 50 times, and then pulling it out and saying, see, no scratches. So whatever the hell you're doing <laughs> to scratch your switch, it ain't putting it in the dock. I and mean, people are like, well, you don't know my life. I put my thing in the switch <laughs> gently three times and it scratched oh, to hell. God. And so... Like, unlike the left Joy-Con thing, which is 100% reproducible, as far as I've been able to tell in my brief Googling around on the scratching thing, is that no one knows what the heck is happening. Um, And chances are good that Nintendo wouldn't have shipped something that could have scratched it. But the screen, as far I think the screen is not glass. And uh, so it, it's conceivable that the two plastics could combine in a way that could cause scratches on the non-light-up part of the screen, which would be bad. So I have been very, very carefully taking my switch no in and way. out of the dock but i was pretty well convinced by that guy going to town on his switch his sacrificial switch in his dock and saying look i'm literally squeezing the napkin holder dock pinch shut as much as i can and jamming this thing out like incredibly rough i'm like if that doesn't scratch it like well, then what is happening like do they they could have a grain of sand inside their dock and that would do it because you know all you need is a grain of sand between two little surfaces and you'll get scratches out of it, especially if it's plastic um but how did sand get in your switch dock? So I don't know. It's I think that is the the least concerning controversy. The Joy-Con thing seems like a hardware problem that they're going to have problems with. It's just you know people are holding it wrong. It's the same thing all over again. You got your your big watery uh, meat bags uh, blocking the signal and some bad <laughs> antenna design mixed in. You know we've all been there and done that. But that doesn't concern me because I'm just going to use the Pro Controller. Or if I didn't use the Pro Controller, I would use it when they're docked to the switch. In which case, signal is not. An issue, you know what I mean? I put the things on the side. I'm not sure Wait that I minute. would ever. It's only a problem when it's in the grip. Is that what you're? Was that what the thing is? No, it's only a problem when it's in your hand. You can use the two Joy Cons like one in each hand, like just holding them. Like you're on the couch and the switch is across the room, right? And oh. you're using the two Joy Cons like that. And when you do that, it's possible to wrap your big meaty adult hand entirely around the left Joy Con in a way that blocks the antenna and causes like bluetooth disconnects right so but so that's the issue everyone's having is only when they're disconnected so if if you use it like all together it's fine yeah yeah, it's fine yeah because i think when it's all together i think it's literally physically connected or if not you certainly can't wrap your hand around the side that's facing the switch because it's you can't get your hand there you know it's connected in that side right 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 I fix it did like a or someone did a teardown to show where the little antenna is and show that like if you attach an extra antenna wire and trace it put it in a different position like you're able to make it much harder to stop with your hand but you know it's it's iPhone four type situation all over again so I'm I'm not concerned about it it's why I didn't I, I was no way I would wait for like oh I'll wait for they make a new hardware revision and fix this problem which they probably will but it's no way in hell I'm waiting I I wanted to play Zelda if I don't succeed in getting a Pro controller anytime soon. Uh, is it is it an acceptable substitute to use either the little plastic thing that comes with with it or to buy the thirty dollar lol charging grip uh to to just use the joy cons as a controller you can try to see what you like i mean the buttons are super tiny on those joy cons and the yeah. joystick is very tiny and it's all kind of small and tiny and awkward and i wouldn't choose to do it with my hands but a lot of people are discovering <laughs> what i discovered long ago i wouldn't ago do that with my hands i do it with your hands yeah <laughs> ergonomically speaking having your left and right hand not joined by like not holding on to a rigid thing you know what i mean like to be able to separate them like you do with the nunchuck and the wii mode or whatever mm-hmm. is ergonomically great for anyone who has kind of rsi issues because you can put your wrists and hands in more neutral positions you're not forced to like with a keyboard you know you're not forced to align your fingers with the home keys or a split keyboard lets your wrist be more neutral or whatever so with the separate controllers a lot of people are either discovering for the first time or rediscovering how comfortable it can be to have those have two completely independent not attached by anything controllers and you can put your hands however is most comfortable for you and just use your thumbs and your fingers to maybe other things i just think they're too small for my hands for the size of my hands but you know your mileage may vary so try either way and the little the little doggy thing i haven't even tried it in that the grip seems fine or whatever it was like honestly why would i ever why would i ever put those things into the little doggy grip when i have the pro controller i i, I don't see myself ever doing that cool I will try to get a pro controller and try to actually download Zelda. I might be working out. By the way, speaking of companies that won't let you give them their money, Sony is the worst at this. Every time I want to buy something on, on Sony's thing, like, it probably is my fault for triggering this. Like, my the expiration date of my credit card changed because I got a new card issued or whatever. And 
maybe I went through and tried to do the purchase before purchase before I had updated the card. It's like, oh, you know, whatever, your purchase didn't go through. It's like, oh, yeah, I got to update the expiration date. So I go update the expiration date and change it to the new one. But it just still won't let me purchase. I delete that credit card, enter another one. Won't let me purchase. And I, like, how many times have I done this? Every time I go to buy something, it's like, guess what? Sony will not let you buy anything with any credit card. With this credit card, with a new credit card, I go through like every credit card I own. Nope, 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 nope. And it's because they do this like 24 to 48 hour lockout to prevent fraud when they think there's some sort of problem. Like, and you Google for it and you see a million people getting payment failures for drawing, buying stuff in the PlayStation Store. It is so incredibly common. And so... I think for the past three times I have bought things, because I buy all downloadable for a PS4. I don't buy plastic discs if I can help it. For the past three times, here's how I buy things on the Sony store. I go to Amazon. I buy a digital download code for $20 worth of credit. <laughs> I get the code. Wow. I enter it into the thing. Like, there's no... I don't lose any money in the deal except for the money that's left over. That's how I buy things on Sony's stupid store, because they won't take my freaking money. They also accept PayPal, but screw PayPal. <laughs> 